Hi, hi everyone. We're just getting everything ready. Um, if somebody from central office could give a shout out that you can hear us and say something so we can hear you on this end. They're all muted. Mr. Levine, could you unmute yourself if you can hear me and say something? Don't believe they're hearing us. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I, we were unmuted too. <coughs> Mr. Levine, if you could just unmute yourself and say something so we can test our audio on this end. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, feedback on this end, it seems like. Could, could you do that again? <laughs> sure, what are you going to say? Um, okay. Hold. Say something more, just a couple more things. We're having some audio difficulties on this side. How about Alewife next stop? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> Hey, Brian, I can't get the click for the panelist link isn't working for me either. The link for the panelist link isn't working for you? Uh-uh. I will. Um, Do you have the number, the meeting ID? I just used it and it worked, but there were two emails 60 seconds yeah, apart. Yeah, I've tried both, both of them. And the link is. Mr. Levine, if you could say something again, just testing. Okay. Keep on going. I was looking to see. Is that the one even for a panelist? Yes. Okay. I see huh. that at the bottom. I wasn't sure if that was the same. So for all the panelists and all the attendees, we're still having some technical difficulties here. So if you just bear with us. I suppose you can always <coughs> elevate me, Karen, if I don't come in that way. Hold on. Okay, you can try again, please. Mr. Levine, if you could speak some more, that would be great. <laughs> Keep, give, tell us the alphabet, maybe. <laughs> okay, so I don't think I came in as a panelist, Karen. <laughs> oh, come on, Jason, sing for us. <laughs> Sure, it's it's, it's <laughs> not, we're not having great audio tonight. But it, what, could it be his mic? It could be your mic. Uh, Another Adnan member. Ms. Kirby, could you do the same? Michelle, I sent you the link. Hello, everyone. Uh, tell, tell us yeah, something. Tell us. It's just where it says click here to join on my computer. Yeah. It's not, that's not making it happy. Huh. Lori sounds I better. There's okay, we're still working on the audio on this end. We've got some real distortion. And we've got a lot of distortion coming through. Karen, is there any way to just ele elevate me to a panelist? Do you see where I am? Could everybody in this room just make sure that your mics are not on on your computers and that your sound is not on on your computers? Because that could. <coughs> so I thought we had all of the sound while we're balanced around us. Yeah. Can we, can we just try somebody else just for a test? Um, Perfect. I don't know if it's just him or if it's us or. Dr. Alan Emma, could you tell us your your name and uh, position at Winchester Public Schools? You're muted. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, it's Jen Alan Emma, Winchester Public Schools. Um, Brian, as they've been testing stuff, I don't know if you heard me before, but you've gotten much softer. We could hear you very clearly at the beginning. Okay. They're working on it. Just want to let you know what it's like for remote. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And we're still having a lot of distortion from um, all of your mics, so it's not just one of you.
again, for those panelists and those at home, we're still working on some technical issues here at WinCam, and I appreciate your patience. Um, this is the regularly scheduled 6 p.m. school committee meeting, and we will uh, convene as soon as we can. WinCam, if you're interested in us testing anything more, let us know. Yes, please. Brian, we're live, but we're live on Zoom, yes? I presume we're live on Zoom. Again, Dr. Ellen Emma, could you uh, uh, tell us where you are right now? It looks like Muir Woods. Uh, yes, I wish. I was, not that I'm not thrilled to be here, but I wish I was actually in Muir Woods. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. They're now they're still working on the sound. Am I still quiet like I was before? Okay, I'm still quiet. Could each member of the committee who's here say something and we also get a verification if they're loud or quiet? Checking the sound for my mic. Could anyone hear? Jen, Karen, Jen or Lori, can you hear me? How about me? A little louder. How about me? Do our voices sound sort of scratchy or do they sound normal? Yeah. How about Not mine? Distorted. You sound better now, Actually, too. Actually, Lori, yeah, Lori sounds better, too. Jen sounds better. Yeah, okay. Jason's better. Okay. We're not hearing it in here, though. Still not hearing it quite in here yet, but I think that's because it's coming through there. I don't believe Karen's mic is live. Can anyone hear Karen? Karen, say something louder. Can you hear me? No. You were tough at the last meeting to hear, too. Okay, uh, Mr. Levine, could you tell us something and see if we can, we can hear your sound? Sorry? Could you say something more? <laughs> like, hello, ABC. Hello, everybody. Task That's good. One, two, three, Dave, can you turn that up? Four, the knob? Yeah. Keep on. Mu much better. Thank, thank you. That is vastly superior. <coughs> okay. Can they hear Karen? Okay. So you guys can't hear Karen either. Very faint. Okay. Can you, um, Michelle, can you say something and see if they can hear you? Hello. Good evening, Winchester. Yes. We okay. can hear her. How about Zena? Hello. Oh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I think it's a tiny bit too loud, but it's like uh, better. so much better than whatever people. it was before. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if they can hear me. Yeah, they can't hear her. Her? Yeah. <laughs> she can have mine. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you, everyone, for being patient with us as we work through this. This is one of the um, costs of uh, COVID, and... Uh, I appreciate everyone's patience and all the hard work by everyone at WinCamp to work through this. Is that a purple one? Yeah, because six is dead. Oh, well, that's that helps. Okay. Okay, Karen, can you say something? Can you hear me now? Testing, testing. Yes. Excellent. Hooray, hooray. Excellent. 
So it appears that we have sound, that everyone can hear us, and we can hear you. Um, I hadn't actually spent the effort to make sure everyone was, uh, who is a panelist, should be a panelist, is a panelist. Are we missing anyone in there? Let us look. Uh, sorry, I hadn't spent the effort. So, so whenever you're ready. OK. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. We have 12 of us as panelists, including um, Wincam. Perfect. So. Frida is here. Oh, Judy's over there. <laughs> let's uh, call this meeting to order. Um, can to give me a countdown and I'll. Mm -hmm. In five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, a couple minutes late to our school committee meeting of October 20th, 2020. Uh, this is a regularly scheduled meeting being held hybrid at WinCam uh, due to COVID-19 closure. The committee and Dr. Evans are all in person. The rest of the members of uh, the district office team are all remote. Uh, I'm going to go over the agenda, and I'm going to take one thing out of order shortly. Um, but I'll start with the agenda. We'll start with a student report, and we'll move into public comment. For reports and discussions items, we have a return to school update, October 1st, 2020 enrollment report, a capital update, which I'd like to, which I'll explain in a moment. I'd like to move to right after the student report. Uh, we have preparation for town November 5th town meeting. We have two action items, a vote to approve an MASC resolution on MCAS and high-stakes testing, a vote to accept Winchester High School PFA grants, chair report, superintendent report, future agenda items, and our next meeting date. Um, with that, I would like to start with the student report, and then after that, I'm just going to give a heads up, I'd like to um, put public comment off for one agenda item and allow the capital update to go second because one of our committee members has to step out for a moment. So start with the uh, student report, and I see that I saw that Caroline and Evan are both there. Hi, guys. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, so to get started, um, we have a brief athletics update. I'm very proud to announce that all of our teams that are currently playing beat Belmont in the last week. So I think it's boys and girls soccer, field hockey, golf, and boys and girls cross country. Um, we also have tomorrow, um, all students in grades 6 through 12 will be participating in the District Student Mental Health Wellness Survey, which is just kind of meant to gauge how we're doing with the return to school, how everything's running and everything's operating as it should be and as well as it can be. Um, also, we are currently working on student class officer and student council elections within the school. We recently had a virtual Google Form version of the normal pieces of paper that we have people sign to submit their candidacy. And at some point over the next week or so, we should be having elections and we should be getting a new set of class officers and student council representatives for all four of our grades. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kat. Um, this week, on, uh, tomorrow, we're having our first um, school virtual club fair. So um, all the clubs at WHS are going to get a Zoom link, and it's attached to our new WHS clubs website. So um, freshmen and any students can join and ask questions to the club leaders and learn about the clubs that way virtually. And that'll be tomorrow. And coming up, we also have the, for the first time ever, the virtual spirit fair which will go, it's an online store and it will go live from November 7th to November 21st. And that's um, all the school sponsored clubs, teams, and activities can post their apparel and can buy them online as opposed to this usually happens in the school cafeteria. Thank you, both of you. Um, I have a quick question, the virtual club fair. Um, can you hear me okay? It's really quiet. Okay. Wait, I can hear you. Okay. Um, the virtual club fair is just high school, or is it middle school and high school? Do you know? I believe this one's just high school. Okay. And do you know what the timing of that is? Is it evening um, or after school? Evan, do you know? The club fair, I think it should be there's a website live where there's um, information about every club, and then the Zoom itself tomorrow where students can ask questions, I believe is from 3.15 to 4 p.m. Okay, excellent. And I assume that the students have all been uh, given that information, even though the adults may not know. So yep, it should be in the morning announcements. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions or comments from the committee members? Ms. Bolognese? 
Oh, I just wanted to comment that I was looking at the club website and was super impressed. I think that's great. What a great way to get the word out. So. That is definitely a huge thanks to Miss White. I know she was really um, crucial in getting the whole system up and running. That's awesome. Mr. Nixon? Sure, I'll throw one out there. Uh, later on in this agenda to our two student reps, uh, the school committee is going to take up some discussion uh, of a, um, a declaration regarding uh, MCAS testing this year, particularly for our high school students. Um, you guys are very hard to hear. I'm sorry. Uh, we can, I don't know if we can turn me up a little bit. How, is that a little bit better, Evan? Great, thank you. So uh, I'm sorry, so I'll start again. Um, at the last school committee meeting, we uh, took up some discussion that's on the agenda again tonight about um, this school committee's position towards MCAS testing, particularly for high school students this year given COVID, um, both the administration of the test and also um, some concern over it continuing to be a uh, graduation requirement. Um, we took no action at the last meeting. Um, I expect we may tonight and look forward to that discussion. I wonder if you or your, your peers have had any discussion about MCAS. Is this on your radar? Is this, is this something you are, you're dreading? Uh, I can't imagine anyone would be looking forward to it, but to the extent there's any sort of sentiment among Winchester High School students about MCAS testing, I'd be interested in hearing it. Um, so I would say that most of our students do MCAS testing similar to any other standardized test that we take for high school. Um, juniors and seniors usually don't have to take it, so we aren't really um, personally too concerned about it. But it actually, we did have concerns brought to student council last year around MCAS season. There was somebody commented that there was a student, I can't remember all the details, but I think it was a student in the special education program who wasn't able to graduate high school because of his MCAS orders because he didn't pass. Um, and they were saying that seemed, there were some questions about that requirement and if there should be exceptions to the MCAS requirement for people in outstanding situations. So we weren't really able to take action on that because that's a little bit out of our domain, but that was definitely, so there are people that I know that have been thinking about that since the end of last year, I can say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Additional questions, comments from the committee? So I do have one question. I. Um, were either or both of you at the recent SAT administration that took place at the high school? And can you, if either of you were there or if you have stories, can you tell us how it went? <laughs> nope. I was not there. Okay. I, would I was just... also not. I do know from students, they said that um, it was as stressful as the SAT usually is. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, almost all students, I think, in the gym space though, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, I that, really. that's I great. Think went, I think it went pretty well. I know some of my friends took the SAT like outside of the high school at other schools and they would run like an hour and a half late. So I know that definitely didn't happen here, which I think is one positive. That, that's great to hear and great to hear. It was just as stressful as always, I guess. Um, so thank you, thank you both very much. Uh, as always, you're welcome uh, as uh, committee members, you're welcome to stay on. You're also welcome to go uh, do whatever you need to do tonight. I appreciate it. It is a school night. So thank you both for coming tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. With uh, permission from the committee, and I think I don't know if we need a vote to do this, I would like to request that we take the capital report out of order because Mr. Nixon needs to step out and we'll be running around some to get, uh, I presume, children to uh, Hockey rinks. I'm in, I'm in hybrid mode tonight. I am both in person and remotely participating. So I would like a motion to take uh, our agenda out of order from someone if they're so inclined. Uh, so moved. And second? Second. Okay, we'll need a roll call vote. Mr. Nixon? Aye. Ms. Bolognese? Aye. Ms. Bergstrom? Aye. Ms. Marchant? Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, so the vote is unanimous. We're going to move on to um, report and discussion items. We will return to public comment. Anyone who is an attendee, we will have a full and um, complete public comment, but we're going to go to capital update, which is item 4C. And if you give me a moment to get to that page. Uh, I am sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know you guys have gone very soft again. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for keeping us aware of that. Um, We'll, we'll talk a little louder, hopefully, but uh, this is a, uh, to provide an update on capital. 
And Mr. Nixon sent the committee two memos that should be supplement to your packet you should have. And I will turn it over to you, Mr. Nixon, if you'd like to kick it off. Um, and again, uh, Dr. Ellen Emma, if we go quiet and you can't hear us, please let us know. Don't, uh, don't wait. <laughs> You know how shy I am. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you to the chair and the committee. And I, and I see we have nearly 50 participants on Zoom tonight. So um, I want to acknowledge those who may want to make public comment. This will not be lengthy. Um, the two memos that you received, one of them is, a, um, is actually a repeat uh, from August 24th. I just wanted to be sure that Frida shared that with you all. Uh, since that was really the detailed rundown of the Morocco Capital Improvement Study. Mm -hmm. And you'll recall we identified a number of things that fell into kind of four different priorities. Uh, priority one from that report was to get going on some roof testing and electrical system testing, some schematic design and specifications. And the urgency in getting the report done quickly uh, was that we'd be in a position to make that request of capital planning. So that's really what I wanted to focus on tonight and a couple of other school-related items. So. Um, uh, just quick overview, uh, these, these are just two small elements really in the big picture. Capital is advancing nearly $11.3 million in request to town meeting. Uh, so, uh, some of that's bonded, of course, including for the large reservoir project. Uh, but coming out of the building stabilization fund, uh, Capital Planning Committee is recommending uh, that we fund the Morocco Priority One scope. Uh, and and th what we actually wanted to do was um, in the interest of simplifying kind of advertisement and award through engineering and planning, we lumped both the roof and electrical work together. Even though those will be given to two very different contractors, you would imagine those are two very different kinds of work. That does give us a little bit of flexibility in, in how that happens. So those that number 143,750 adds up to the two numbers you saw from me back in, uh, in August. Um, so that appears uh, on the warrant. And then the other item that uh, was advanced for fall town meeting consideration is $60,000 for some ar architectural evaluation and specifications for the repair of what I might describe as the central historic facade of McCall Middle School. That was our original Winchester High School. Um, at least it was original in 1932. Um, and uh, a lot of the waterproofing, the flashings are original to the building. They have really deteriorated um, and that's causing uh, the failure of plaster in classroom spaces and offices. And so that's not getting better, uh, it's getting worse. And we have some safety issues associated with the areaways on either side of the, of the building as the balustrade continues to deteriorate. So this is something that committee members will remember has been on our five-year capital plan for many years. Um, it's come close in years past, but didn't quite make the cut. Um, this time, the capital planning committee actually went on a tour throughout town of all of the different project requests, not just school requests, DPW, fire, police. And I think it was really helpful for the capital planning committee to lay eyes on McCall and see the poor condition. So we look forward to uh, town meeting support for this. But again, this is just schematic to help us really kind of scope out the nature of the work um, that's required. Um, the committee did uh, not advance our ask for the Parkhurst School, but I'm, I'm sure we'll continue to talk about our needs at Parkhurst with capital as we move forward. Um, the other request that uh, did get advanced from the Capital Stabilization Fund that, again, I touched on in our memo on August 24th is the Morocco Culvert Project, what we call Project 10. It is the, the final project of our years-long flood <coughs> mitigation plan in Winchester. We're requesting $410,000 to take what is more of a sort of conceptual plan for that project and bring it to full construction documents ready for bidding and to complete all the permitting. This is a major project because what it will, will, what it will in effect do is it not only completes the town-wide flood mitigation plan, but once complete, we'll be able to remap the town. And uh, many homes in the Morocco community, perhaps as many as 80, 90, or 100 homes, and forgive me, I don't have the count, but many, many Morocco community uh, homes are going to actually come out of the 100-year floodplain, uh, which is going to make a difference in some families' pocketbooks. But just as a practical matter, the 100-year floodplain is going to um, uh, it's going to change by about three and a half feet. So that's a huge change um, that, that we look forward to. How it matters to the school committee, of course, is the 100-year floodplain kind of cuts <coughs> diagonally through the back of the existing Morocco site. So once the project is complete and we remap, it frankly just frees up more space for consideration when we do come to a, a time and a place where we're seriously looking at replacing the Morocco school. So the cost for that work is right now around $7 million as kind of a, a, 
uh, uh, a working number that may change a little bit. And to remind the committee, out of the Flansburg report, uh, looking at the school, we said maybe between three and a half and four million dollars in priorities. And to remind those listening tonight, the purpose of making a three and a half or four million dollar investment in Morocco was that this committee, this administration felt strongly that as excited as we were to be partnering with the state on the Lynch project, we didn't want to hold Morocco together with sort of band-aids and duct tape for eight or ten years. We wanted to make some meaningful investments in Morocco to continue to keep these spaces uh, supportive for learning and, and instruction. Um, so you add that up, four and seven, we're between 10 and a half, 11 million dollars. And a question the capital planning committee had was, well, where does that come from? Well, we don't have those kind of resources in the stabilization funds. So at the end of this memo, as you'll note, I'm, I'm pleased to share that on Tuesday, September 1st, uh, we met with the uh, select board to discuss the uh, recommendations for the Morocco school, as well as project 10. And uh, in a, a non-binding but unanimous vote, uh, the select board uh, expressed um, interest in uh, both anticipating and supporting some alternative means of funding for both of these. And that could include an override of some sort. So um, I'm very pleased with that. I hope the school committee is, is pleased with that. Um, it's something for us to continue to look at and, and work on. In terms of next steps then for Morocco, should fall town meeting um, approve the uh, electrical and roof testing for the Morocco school. We would look to have that complete uh, by the summer um, and then would have a firmer understanding of the costs to a sort of complete design and construction that we could begin to kind of package into a larger uh, override moving forward. So just some good progress that I wanted to uh, share with you all tonight and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Uh, are there any questions or comments? First of all, Dr. Evans, do you have anything you would need to add, or should I just move directly into questions from the committee? Uh, I'm very grateful that uh, Mr. Nixon has taken on the responsibility of uh, being uh, so in intimately involved with these recommendations, and I think we can have a lot of confidence uh, in his longstanding uh, work with this. He has a great understanding of what the priority should be, and he's represented the school department extraordinarily well, so I'm very appreciative for that. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? I have a quick question if no one else does. I know that they have not remapped yet <coughs> because we're waiting for the final flood projects to be completed. The remapping of the flood, uh, uh, I believe it's the 100 year flood yeah. level. Um, do we have a preview of what, obviously not tonight to look at, but do we have an idea of what it's gonna mean for that piece of property that M Morocco is at? We do. And what kind of flexibility that will give us? Is it a lot or a little? Um, we do, it will, um, my memory is it will actually take the complete existing Morocco site out of the 100 year floodplain. Um, VHB, um, who's been engaged with us on many of these projects, I think actually do, has produced a map that's kind of indicated generally the area that would come out, but um, as I guess is always the case, one has to see how it comes in the wash with, okay. uh, comes out of the wash right with FEMA. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think it would just give us a tremendous amount of flexibility. Um, on that note, I will also share, though, that the largest development in the history of the city of Woburn, which is the Vale project at the old General Mills plant, uh, excuse me, General Foods plant, um, stands to bring a lot of water into Winchester. And so this is one area that um, I think our uh, senior staff are really looking at and engaging in, like the engineering department and so forth. We, we think about traffic a lot when we think about the Vale project, but I know there are concerns about water as well. So that's something that folks are working hard on to sort of represent our interest, because we certainly don't want to spend all this money and then find we have more water than we did before. Of so course. That, there's a risk there, depending upon how that development plays out. Thank you, and this will be very helpful just, uh, I mean, you made it clear, but I just want to reiterate, very helpful uh, when we get an opportunity to renovate or rebuild Morocco in its entirety, that we'll have more opportunity to use that site um, if we should so choose. So um, this is very directly, uh, it helps the school department and helps our students, so. Brian, Thank I have a quick question too. Before. Yes, Ms. Bergstrom. So first of all, I, I, got, I just got a text from somebody who said that they cannot, they can only hear us when we're really close to the mics. So if everybody can lean in when you're speaking. <laughs> um, and um, Mr. Nixon, on this 
um, on the update you provided us, they said that um, uh, the committee did not place any Parkhurst requests on the warrant because they're looking for um, a plan. Can you explain to us what kind of plan they're looking for? What level of detail? Um, when you say plan, that could mean everything from this committee sure. takes a vote on what we want to do with Parkhurst to sure. a written So that's document. a good question. Um, and I, I think we haven't talked about this probably since May or June with the superintendent. Um, so when the, when, the, uh, when the capital planning committee voted to support the elevator request, which was obviously crucially important in making the full building available to us since the state had banned us from using the lower level. You all will remember we had some cost overruns in the development of that elevator. So the Capital Planning Committee, recognizing that it was a very long lead item, approved the elevator, but also made the request that we understand what the plan is in terms of how the building will be used. So for instance, if it is a integrated early childhood center with pre-K students, that implies a certain type of use and some facility needs that would be, let's say, different than if it was a K-5 school. Or for that matter, if we said we would bring in some, you know, um, middle school students or something. I'm not saying that we've talked about that. But, you know, how the building is ultimately used, who's occupying the building, and what their needs are can really drive what the facility needs are in the building. So the Capital Planning Committee recognizes that sort of just like the Mystic School, which we kind of is, is used not by us directly, but through the rec department and through a third party that you know leases the building. There are a lot of needs at both of those buildings and you can make a case for a lot of investments, but they add up to a lot of money. And it's not in our 10-year facilities master plan to be spending a lot of money on those buildings, right? right? So the Capital Planning Committee was basically saying, if we're gonna make this kind of investment in the elevator, what else is there? Is there another million dollars we need to spend? Is it two? Is it three? Because clearly that number could get ahead of us to a point where it, it's not gonna be funded from the stabilization funds. Right. So, but to get back to your specific question, it's not a detailed plan about exactly which kids go into which room, but something, even if it's very high level, that says we're gonna plan on bringing our pre-K students there, for instance, next fall, and that frees up room at Lynch and at the O, and that's certainly something Dr. Evans has talked about as a possibility. Um, that information would be very helpful for them. Okay, so they're just looking for a discussion of this committee to direct. Uh, they're, they're looking for some indication. I mean, it's not really our decision. It's really Dr. Evans' decision, but right. they're looking for some direction on kind of the, the, the planning of the building, the future of the building. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up follow -up? question? There was a Parkhurst-related re capital request. Can you tell us where that, if that was ranked or if it was not ranked because of this? And it, if it did That's rank, where did it rank? So it, did, it was ranked, so committee members should be clear. Committee members don't say, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't get this information I was looking for, so I'm gonna sort of ignore this. Everything gets ranked. It actually came in ninth out of that fund. It just simply, it, 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 frankly, from a financial point of view, it fell below our threshold of available funding as well. But that was a sentiment that was expressed in the committee's discussion was we need, we need to plan. And we talked about this as well when Dr. Evans came and made her presentation. Um, she certainly described some of the challenges this year with coronavirus and so forth, right. um, not only in terms of workload, but how that's actually impacting the students that are even in the district. We have a lot of remote kids, and we've talked, I think, around this table at how many, how many age-eligible kindergartners are not here I might put Dr. Evans on the spot. I don't know if we know the percentage, but it's, it's a significant number of kids, right, that are age 75. eligible, they're being held back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Any additional questions um, or comments on the capital plan, the capital update, excuse me? Thank you, Mr. Nixon, for a very thorough report. Uh, and uh, I guess I do have a, one last question. What are the next steps? We're going to, this will be at Fall, fall Town, Town Meeting. meeting okay. Which I think opens on the 5th the of fifth. November. I'm, I believe that's right. Yes, it's correct. it is correct. It is correct. The yeah. 5th. Yep. Um, I think the goal of the moderator is to do this in uh, two nights. Um, and we have, uh, I think, a link <coughs> consent agenda set up for Fall Town Meeting. I believe this is an item that we're planning on being as a part of the consent agenda. There's no specific presentation associated with the Morocco work, or for that matter, McCall. But if members have questions, we're certainly prepared to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Uh, with the completion of that agenda item, I would like to return back to our regularly scheduled agenda, not in progress, but starting right now, um, which is public comment. 
Uh, before we begin public comment, I'd like to remind everyone that public comment is a chance for members of the public to express their opinions on matters under the jurisdiction of the school committee. It's not a dialogue, and the committee is under no obligation to respond to comments. Public comments are limited to three minutes per person, and tonight we will attempt to keep comments to a total of 20 minutes, although we'll see how that goes. And so what I'd like to ask, before we begin public comment, I would like to ask everyone, I'm going to lower all hands, and then I'm going to ask anybody who would like to have public comment to raise their digital hand starting now, and we will start calling on people who would like to give public comment. Uh, Ms. Bolognese, are you willing to? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, we have Ms. Nicole Lentine. OK. Ms. Lentine, if you would state your name and address for the committee. Hi, I'm Chloe Lentine, Nicole Lentine's daughter. I live at 4 Summer Trail, Suite 3. And I'm a fifth grader at Vincent Owen Elementary. Dr. Evans in the school committee. I'm doing hybrid learning this school year. I love being in school, but the remote days are not good, and I dread them the day before. I don't know how most kids feel about remote learning, but I know that I do not like it. I especially don't like the choice boards. I feel that I'd be learning so much more in school. I do not think that the choice boards are teaching me anything. They are way too easy, and I'm done with at least seven or eight every day. The specials are also something that's hard for the students. The teachers are not teaching what they normally teach, and that is making the specials hard to enjoy. They are all almost an hour long, and I have two of them at a time. They all drag on, and I am constantly counting down the minutes until they are over. This never happens when I am in school. On top of that, we have zones at recess, and I am not allowed to even talk to other classes. In my first two weeks of school, I had the parking lot zone, and my whole class was beginning to wish that recess would end quicker, including me. Also, I can't talk to my friends at lunch or snack because we have our masks down. I don't like this decision, mainly because at lunch we have plexiglass in between us. At snack time, we are outside and always six feet apart, yet we can't talk. My friend and I had to write on post-it notes just to communicate with each other. Finally, we were spending way too much time on computers. It is not good for kids to be staring at a screen every minute of the day. I had a frustrating morning yesterday, and my mom told me to write a letter to tell you how I felt. So that's what I did. I wrote this 100% myself. Thank you for listening. Chloe Lentine. Thank you very much, Ms. Lentine. I actually really appreciate when we have our students in town or, um, come to us. That was a very eloquent uh, letter you. you read, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, we, I will again let Ms. Bolognese tell us. Let's see. Uh, next, we have uh, J.P. Boylan. Uh, J.P. Boylan, you, if you would state your name and address for the committee for speaking. Uh, thank you. It's Joanna Boylan at uh, 9 Tap Drive. Thank you. Um, Chloe, that was amazing. But uh, I wanted to say uh, I reached out to uh, Jeff Riley's office the Commissioner of Education, and they sent over a copy of the uh, Memorandum of Understanding between DESE and Teachers Unions. Uh, in the revised for COVID agreement, elementary school students are required to receive 170 days and 850 hours of, quote, structured learning time, end quote. Structured learning time is defined in the regulations as time during which students are engaged in regularly scheduled instruction, <coughs> learning activities, learning assessments within the curriculum of core subjects and other subjects. Uh, it continues with, the following activities do not count towards minimum hours. Recess, social or informal check-ins, unstructured study periods, and optional school work. I cannot speak for the middle school and high school curriculum, but the K through five program does not have 850 hours of structured learning time, which breaks down to five hours a day, 25 hours a week. Giving the schools the benefit of the doubt, I will stipulate that they are receiving, students are receiving 10 hours during the two day in school instruction. On the Wednesday full class Zoom, 
uh, school is from 8.15 to 11.20. Even though there is a half hour break during these three hours of instruction, I will generously round up. The remaining two remote days, Zoom school is one and a half hours each day. Choice boards, by definition, do not fall within the structured learning time, where at best they are considered optional schooling and at worst unstructured study periods. That brings the generous total to 16 hours instead of the required minimum of 25 a week. That's 510 hours for the school year instead of 850. Our K through five kids are missing 340 hours of education this year. This is a violation of the contract and a failure, your failure, of the Winchester Public School System to provide the bare minimum. And as a side note, I didn't realize when I moved to Winchester that I would be begging for the bare minimum. And you may think that this failure is occurring in all school districts, but you would be incorrect. <clears throat> Putting aside the private schools, which many Winchester residents flock to this year, and more will do so next year, including myself and my two kids, there are public school districts that have prioritized elementary school kids, as was directed by the governor in August. There are public school districts that have understood that a senior in high school and a first grader cannot be taught in the same way. And those school districts didn't simply throw their hands up and develop one catch-all program for this year. As a result, those kids are receiving 850 hours of school. And our public school kids, because of you and your decisions, are receiving 40% less than them. During Commissioner Riley's town hall meeting last week, he stated that his department will be monitoring districts to ensure they are meeting these learning time requirements. In my communications with the department this week, I informed them that Winchester was not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boylan. I appreciate your uh, comment, and with that, uh, Ms. Bolognese, if you can help me. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Inferna. Mr. Inferna, if you could state your name and address for the committee. Sure, it's uh, Philip Inferna. I'm from Four Lantern Lane here in Winchester. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. Great. I'd like to share publicly and for the committee here the main points that were captured in my email dialogue over the past seven or 10 days or so with Dr. Evans and the committee. I'll start by saying that, you know, thank you. I really appreciate um, Dr. Evans engaging in the discussion uh, in these points this week. It was certainly very helpful to um, have that dialogue. I really have two main points that I'd like to emphasize here again. Um, really, one is I feel strongly that we need, and this sort of tees a little bit off of what we just really heard, is a clear and transparent plan that lays out our path for more in-person schooling. Um, Dr. Evans shared in my email dialogue that there are several teams and committees working on this, and she has hopes to see something in draft form by early December. I think that's you know, great to hear. Um, in my assessment, I would say I do think we are way behind on this. I would ask the committee to get this plan delivered before the end of the calendar year at minimum to the rest of us. I think this is critical information for families to make the decisions about alternate education plans for their children. Um, our family has been making sacrifices this year to supplement our kids' education, um, paying for private teachers and um, getting our kids schooling outside of the district uh, to supplement. And we are in a position like many others that have to make a decision about whether we're going to stick with the district or move on. And absent of a plan, we really are going to be forced to make that decision with the assumption that there isn't likely to be a return to school 
either this year and potentially into next, um, as we don't know what criteria are going to be used to make that decision. So I would just like to emphasize, I think that's very important, and I think that this is something we really should have had before this school year started, and it, we really would like to see this no later than the end of the calendar year. The second point I want to emphasize is I understand and seen in the, the uh, agenda for today that there is a vote regarding MCAS. I've read Dr. Evans' position on MCAS. She elaborated more on this over email. Um, this is an area in which we have some agreement and some disagreement. As I expressed, I think that testing this year is of critical importance. I feel that making that not a re uh, graduation requirement for a senior is a very fair thing to do. I think it takes the stakes down. If you could take a moment, hold on for a moment. I think we're having a couple of technical issues here, and then we'll return to you, Mr. Inferna. I think we are better if you would like to proceed. Thank you. My apologies. Sure, no problem. So as I was saying, I, I, I'm certainly supportive of, of removing the MCAS as a requirement for our seniors. They're not getting the education that they would have otherwise had. Um, and I think that's only fair. And I think it lowers the stakes. However, eliminating the MCAS, I think, is a really irresponsible decision for our town to make if they were to sort of go down that path. And I do understand that that's just really a recommendation that we're trying to make to the governor. But I say this because we know that our kids are getting less education this year. And the MCAS is a mechanism that we have years worth of data going back. And it would be really a, a, a misstep, of, I think, to eliminate that and not have a real clear data point as to what has taken place in the education of our children from last year. We really stopped schooling in March and we have not returned in any normalcy uh, this year. So I would really encourage the committee to consider that. Uh, of course, some of the students would like to not take the test if given the chance, but the reality is we need that information for our district, for ourselves, and for the administration. And I think we can remove the stakes from that and still get the data point. So that's really the, the two main points. Again, I appreciate the dialogue over email, um, and I just wanted to make those comments uh, publicly known um, thank you very much. Thank you for the comments, and my apologies for the slight technical difficulties in the middle. Uh, with that, Ms. Bolognese, if you... Next, we have um, Ms. Hoffman. Hold Ms. on. Ms. There we go. Ms. Hoffman, if you would state your name and address for the committee. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you very well. Thank you. Okay. My name is Erica Hoffman. It's Stephen Fielding Terrace. Um, I just, I, I think that, um, and this is in regards to your NCAS um, testing thing, I think that for the lower grades, the NCAS testing should occur this year, and that NCAS learning should be taught on the remote days, and not take up the two in-person days we currently have. And this will show, um, I, this will be a great way to show, show how effective uh, remote learning is. Um, on the different topic of just in-person in um, in learning, um, other districts such, such as Western, Carlisle have moved forward and have increased the amount of hours that their K through five learners are receiving to, uh, to five full days of in-person. Dover, Midway and Cambridge, K through three, uh, third grade, are back to four, four full days. These districts have shown that they have heard the voices of their communities and the school committee members and superintendent have shown leadership within their district, which Winchester seems to be lacking, as we have no plan for more in-person hours and have only just started developing a plan. Winchester needs to, be, to, needs to look at changing their hybrid model in order to be, a, in order to be able to accommodate more in-person days for our K through five grade levels. Whether that's an AM and a PM cohort with daily attendance or sending a cohort home at 12.30 for lunch and continued learning. You, will need, you need to consider Wednesday mornings in the classroom and phase this in, just like other school districts have, um, for example, Reading. How is it that other school districts have pivoted on their plans, for example, Leffington has moved to a full, um, full in-person cohort weeks every other week, which is still more than what Winchester students are giving? DC says that school districts need to prioritise K-5 through for in-person learning. 
and I feel Winchester is failing at this. I have spoken with several teachers who say they need more in-person hours with the K through five grade levels, and their voices not being heard by Dr. Evans. Why is the school committee and Dr. Evans not listening to our teachers? I am very concerned about our children being, uh, falling behind its parochial schools, private schools, and other public school districts either have their children back full-time in person or have considerably more in-person or synchronous learning than Winchester children. DC says that districts should be teaching five hours per day, either in-person or synchronous learning, and Winchester is not doing this. I was hopeful over the summer that Winchester would do the right thing for our children and look after their educational best interests. And so my husband and I decided to keep our two boys in Winchester rather than sending them to a private school. I am sick and tired of hearing excuse after excuse from the school committee and Dr. Evans that Winchester does not have the dollars per pupil like other school districts, that it's too hard negotiating with the four unions, that we do not have the resources, and most importantly, not listening to the voices of the Winchester community and not taking action based on those voices. That is why, with great sadness, and at no fault of my son's teacher, who is doing her absolute best in a tough situation, that my husband and I are pulling our third grade to the sun with Theo this week and enrolling him in parochial school. And we will be looking to do the same for our first grader if this, is not, if this is what the school year will look like in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Uh, Ms. Bolognese, if you could tell us who will be. Um, next up, we have Ms. Court. Ms. Court, if you would state your name and address for the committee. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. You weren't there sorry yet. About that. Now you're there. Ms. Court, if you state your name and address for the committee. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we, we, yes. We, we can. Sorry about all of our technical issues earlier, but we can hear you loud and clear now. No worries on the technical issues. Um, Pamela Court, Arlington Street. I have two high school students, and we are fully remote. Um, I, I want to point out, um, and this is more a comment to the general community, that we are all sacrificing. Both of my kids are fully remote because we have health issues in my household that make the risks of COVID much, um, much more severe for us. And so this is not a choice that we made lightly, nor is it a, a choice that we took pleasure in making. And we are also sacrificing enormously um, to balance safety and education. And so I just want people to be clear on that. Um, on the topic of remote, and I, I want to thank everybody there because I know that it's an enormous amount of work that you're all still putting in insane hours and fielding an enormous amount of information, both from above and below, and dealing with, with issue after issue um, as they come up. But I do appreciate that. Um, what I am still feeling, though, and it's been brought up a number of times by others, is that remote sometimes gets left out of the equation when considering planning for events. Um, and in particular, um, when you start talking about high stakes testing, such as SATs or MCAS, um, we're out of school for a reason. We're out of school because it's higher risk. And um, I'll add a little side note that if folks want schools to open up completely, that um, compliance with safety measures is critical. That the more we comply, the better our numbers, the more likely schools are going to open. So please. If you're complying, continue to do so. And if you've loosened up the reins on that, tighten them again. If you want school to open up fully, tighten those reins, get it under control, be compliant, and let's get everybody back in school when it's safe. Um, but back to testing, MCAS in particular. For um, younger kids, you can opt out without consequences. For the high schoolers, it is a state requirement that you pass the MCAS in order to get a diploma instead of a certificate of completion. And if that means that we then have to go in for a proctored exam, my experience with the last proctored exam was that things were not conveyed to me as they would have been. I would have made a different decision about sending my son in for the PSAT if I had known. And I did send a letter to all of you about that. Um, we are fully remote. We are not aware of what standard practices are in the school. So if it's standard practice to allow kids to take off their masks in the bathroom or around the bathrooms, 
or to remove their masks to take sips of water during the day, that's not something that's obvious to remote parents who were told at the beginning of the year, before school started, during one of the meetings, that there would be special outdoor locations for people to take water breaks. So we have no way of knowing if that has changed through practice. And because we're remote, because many of us are choosing it for safety reasons, sending our kids in for high state testing is a high anxiety endeavor. And it felt like it wasn't considered that that we that our particular needs weren't thought of, and um, and I know that you're trying to juggle a million different details, and it's not easy. So I do appreciate that. So this is not in any way intended to be, you know, finger pointing and saying that that you're all are not working hard. But I'm imploring you to please consider the particular needs of remote students and accommodations that we may need should we be required to make some hard decisions about whether or not we have to send our kids in and take a greater risk that impacts our family's health when it comes to these high state tests. So that's just the thing that I'm going to ask you. And again, to remind you that you, you've got to remember we're not in the schools. We don't know how things are going. So um, we, we go by information that we get from you. It has to be as complete as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Court. Uh, I see, at least on my screen, that we have four additional people with their hands raised. Is that what you see as well? That's what I see. Yes. So I'd like I to take all I see four five, the, Brian. Oh, five? No, we had six. Four. Yeah. Uh, I was going to I was gonna take four more. We had four when I said that. And I, I'd like to take those four more so that we get everything completed that we want to complete tonight. And I'd also like to ask if when Kim is listening, we've been told that we're still, the uh, committee is still quite quiet over the uh, broadcast. So I don't know if that's something that we can adjust. Uh, Ms. Bolgiase, can you tell me who's next? Miss um, <clears throat> Inferna. Ms. Inferna, if you would state your name and address for the committee. Sure, it's Jennifer Inferna at 4 Lantern Lane. Thank you. Um, Yes, I just wanted to support Ms. Boylan's comments. She was so eloquent. Um, I, too, have concerns regarding Winchester's current learning model and that it does not meet state requirements for hours of structured learning required by the state. Dr. Evans and school committee members, our children are not receiving five hours a day of structured learning time. I'm very concerned that Winchester Public Schools is not providing the required time instructed by the state. I highlight this today so that the school committee can remedy this problem by changing the learning model, age appropriately across the district. Families need to ask themselves today, are your children receiving five hours of learning each day required by the state? I can tell you that my second and third graders do not have this opportunity each day provided by Winchester Public Schools. If other families are having the same experience, Dr. Evans, the superintendent, the State Department of Secondary and Elementary Education and the school committee need feedback requiring Winchester's failure to provide the required hours of learning for the 2021-2022 school year. I suggest that Winchester Public Schools send out an additional survey to parents to gauge just how many hours of learning time students are actually receiving on remote learning days and share the results of this survey with the Winchester community. In addition, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has asked schools to provide in-person learning for several groups, prioritizing it, including K through five, to address differences in abilities to learn remotely. I have stated since the summer that one size does not fit all in regards to learning models and continue to be perplexed as to why Winchester Public Schools has implemented the same learning model for kindergartners as for seniors in high school. Clearly, there is a difference in how these age groups learn and the amount of in-person learning time needed to achieve curriculum goals. My seven-year-old son has three consecutive hours of Zoom on Wednesdays, like many other children in the district, which is not an age-appropriate learning experience for him or other children his age. His teacher is fantastic. She puts so much energy in planning to make the Zooms engaging, but it is not realistic for 20-plus seven-year-olds to stay engaged on a Zoom for three hours. I have heard troubling stories from parents whose children are scared to ask questions when they're on Zoom. They don't understand what's going on. They can't follow along. They sit alone 
confused, scared, staring at the screen with no recourse. Children who are not able to follow instructions cannot access the content on their Chromebooks. Children fear being on the screen. All this leads is to tears, frustration, and anxiety. These students are not learning and their confidence is plummeting further and further every day. Other school districts have maximized in-person learning for K through five as instructed by the state. They have implemented different learning models for K through five versus middle and high school students. Winchester has the ability to do this, but has simply chosen not to. I encourage the school committee to respond to the concerns raised by the community and make changes. Wednesdays could be half days in person for each cohort, some in the morning, some in the afternoon. Some districts, such as Marblehead, are alternating full days on Wednesdays every other week for each cohort. If what is preventing us from putting more children in the classroom is three feet or plexiglass, that problem can be solved. Approximately 80% of Winchester's families chose hybrid learning because in-person learning works best for their child and their families. I asked the school committee to make modifications to the current hybrid model and include more in-person learning for K through five based on feedback and the needs of this specific population. As elected officials and representatives of the Winchester residents for which you serve, I ask you to consider whether the current Winchester learning models are meeting state standards and in line with the school committee's mission, which I quote, is to provide all students with an outstanding education in a nurturing yet challenging environment that fosters academic achievement, healthy social and emotional development, enthusiasm for education, and a lifelong love for learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bolognese. Uh, um, so next we have Ms. Reynolds. Uh, Ms. Reynolds or uh, Shannon Reynolds, if you would state your name yes. and address for the committee. And Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, per perfect. Thank you. My name is Shannon Reynolds. I live at 79 Walnut Street. I have two elementary school children. Um, I would first like to say that my children's teachers are wonderful. They've always had wonderful teachers, um, and that's no exception this year. So anything that I'm about to say is not a reflection of the quality of teaching that they're getting, it's strictly the quantity. Um, this summer, like many other parents of young learners, I spoke in support of a return to full in-person learning. And as you remember, we were told at the time that full return was not an option on the table, that our options were either a hybrid model or full remote. Embedded within the discussion about our options, it was stated multiple times that teachers and the district have been working tirelessly over the summer to improve remote learning. That remote learning in the spring was less than desirable because of the sudden nature of the shutdown. And now with more time to prepare, remote learning would be challenging, full, and robust. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the case at the elementary school level. My children receive zero instruction of core concepts on their two full remote days. Yet the district receives credit for educating them on those days. They have 90 minutes of specials, such as art, music, or library. And on more than one occasion, the teacher hasn't been there, and there's been no substitute. I was told by Dr. Evans today that substituting for instruction on support um, days or, high, or remote days is not a priority right now. The remaining four and a half hours of each day must be filled by me having the children navigate activities through their choice board. There is no parental support for these activities, no instruction of how they're learning, what they've learned so far, what on the choice board is a new concept, or what is something that is very basic that they should have mastered. I literally have no idea what they have learned and what is on the choice board if, if it's something they should know. So other towns have been much more creative and are finding ways to more actively educate our children I will add to the list that Burlington today in a public meeting said that they hope to transition their elementary students to full-time in-person in January. And I would say that to say that we don't have the resources to have the children in school more often is not acceptable. We live in one of the wealthiest towns in the state. We have creative and innovative parents who are highly motivated to have their children in school. I think that we can work with this together. 
but I'd like to ask for more transparency regarding our children's education, specifically regarding what is our plan for return to school? What parameters would need to be met for students to have more in-person days? Can Wednesday deep cleaning days be used for teaching in school instead? In my opinion, the sentence, we'll get back to school when it's safer, is really not an acceptable answer. Cases are up across the town and the state, but to my knowledge, there have been no known cases transmitted in the schools yet in our town. So it has been through community spread. So why are our children having less time in school and more time in the community? How much of our children's curriculum has been cut? Logic would tell me that it's more than 50%. So how are the decisions being made regarding what gets cut and what stays? And will this information be relayed to parents so that we can investigate ways to supplement our children's learning? Um, I'm curious to know the results of the recent superintendent survey and if this will be made available to us. Is there a discrepancy in satisfaction of remote learning between elementary and high school students? Um, have we considered the option of having high schoolers do more remote so that we can utilize the space to have more elementary school students in the classrooms? And then finally, I'd be very curious to know how many students have unenrolled from Winchester Public Schools this year and how much of a change is that from previous years? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bolognese, can you tell me exactly how many uh, hands we have raised still? We have three hands raised. Okay, so we'll take those three hands and no more after that. So if your hand is raised right now, we will call on you. And after that, we will close public comment. And next we have Ms. Ronan. Oh. Oh, Ms. Ronan, if you would state your name and address for the committee. Hi, Christina Ronan at 129 Cambridge Street. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I want to talk about enrollment. Um, my six-year-old uh, kindergartner was thrilled to begin her um, Ambrose career as a red bird, like her big brother. Um, but when the school decisions were made, um, we made the difficult decision of pulling her out of Ambrose and enrolling her in kindergarten at St. Mary's in town. She is thriving there um, five full days. Her brother in third grade, uh, Matt Ambrose, um, obviously very much enjoys his in-person days. I can't say the same for his remote days. More and more families are pulling their kids um, from Winchester Public Schools. And I believe that these departures are propelled by the fact that there is no return to full um, plan, that there is no talk about getting more in-person learning, even just hours of it. Um, it is my understanding that Dr. Evans is going to be providing an enrollment report later tonight, at least that's what I see on the agenda. Earlier this earlier year at another school committee meeting, um, I heard that she projected that we had lost between 20 to 25 percent incoming kindergartners this fall. If we have no return to school plan for next fall, how many more kid in our kindergartners are we going to lose and what will be the impact on our budget and, and frankly how many more students just in general are we going to lose because we don't have a plan um, and, and that's the question I want to bring um, to the committee and, and to Superintendent Evans mind. thank you so much thank you very much Ms. Ronan uh, I believe we have two more uh, public comments remaining uh, next we have Ms. McCarthy Ms. McCarthy if you'd state your name and address for the committee Hi, my name is Michelle McCarthy. I live at 29 Oxford Street. I have three children in the Winchester Public School System. Thank you all of you at the school committee, superintendent, principals, teachers. I know how hard you're all working, but I have to be direct. This is not working for my family and for many. Every single day, every playground, every pickup, everywhere I go, parents are telling me how upset they are, especially at the elementary level. Two days a week in school is not enough. My fifth graders in Ambrose only have about two hours a morning on Wednesday. Two hours for fifth graders on Wednesday remote is not enough. My fifth graders in Ambrose only have 1.5 hours of electives, art, music, gym, PE on Thursday and Friday. 1.5 hours for a fifth grader who will be going to hopefully will call next year is not enough. I respectfully ask that the Winchester Public School System please consider getting Wednesday as a back-to-school in-person teaching day. I understand through the cohort that this might be something like it every other week, 
but it is really important, especially at the elementary school level, for the children to be educated in person for three consecutive days. I, this is very important. I must also ask for more substance with the choice forms that are provided. There is no feedback. I don't know if it's tied into the curriculum. I don't know what happens to what I had when I was little with good old fashioned homework and homework packets. I know that doesn't work for every family, but I believe it should be optional. You have told us year after year that we should not have our children online, but they should wait until eighth grade. But now, the only thing they're given on Thursday and Friday, their day off, is hours online looking at choice work. It's very unfair, very, very discouraging. I must admit, over the summer, I was very concerned that our children would not go back to school in person. So I applied to a local Catholic school for my family. However, my three children won. They did not want to leave the Winchester public school system. I did not want them to leave. We love walking to school. We love Amber's. We had a wonderful experience at McCall Middle School. But two days is just not enough of an education. And it's really unfair. We have so many friends who have left to go to local private schools that are a mile away in Medford, Arlington, Hoover, Lexington. They are all going five days a week, full time. And as I sit here and try to decide what I do, I must ask that you please let us know now. Are we only going to be in school, in person, for two days a week for a whole year? If that's the case, my family will have no other decision but to remove our children from the Winchester Public School System. I can't just sit by. I tried. We came back this fall. We believe in Winchester. We moved here for your school system. But two days a week in person for my fifth graders is just not acceptable. And we need to know now. Is this the plan for the year? Is there a plan? Is there a plan in January to possibly go back or in the spring? What are we doing next year? Is the plan next year only two days a week? In conclusion, I please ask that you all realize that two days a week of in-person education, especially at the elementary school level, is not enough. I ask that you please consider having Wednesday be an in-person teaching. I ask that the curriculum coordinators please put some more substance on the Thursday Friday choice board. And I ask superintendent and school committee members to please let parents know now, we want to stay in Winchester, we're begging you, but we really need more help from you. We need more substance, we need more in-person learning, especially for these young children. Fortunately, mine are 10 years old, and they're better on Zoom and some of the techie issues than I am, but many of my neighbors in my neighborhood are very young children in kindergarten, first grade. They cannot do them, and they are all going to pull their children and go to local schools where they can go and get in-person teaching for five days a week. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for your hard work. I really hope that this works out, and I really hope that we do not have to remove our children from the public school system. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy. And I believe we have one last public comment, and after that we will close public comment. Last is um, Ms. DeLeo. Hold on. Ms. DeLeo, if you would state your name and address for the committee. Hi, yes, Susan DeLeo, 24 Taft Drive. Thank you. Um, good evening, thank you all for taking my final comment tonight. Um, I'm speaking tonight to urge you again to develop a plan to increase in-person hours and return to in-person learning. As many other speakers tonight have said, I believe we are not satisfying the state required hours of instruction. I encourage you to look into creating more in-person hours on alternate Wednesdays especially for our youngest learners, K through five. As I have mentioned several times, my twins who are in first grade fall into the category of typical learners who do not engage well with remote learning. We have worked with their wonderful teacher, the school principal, and the social emotional coaches available at the schools. Still, my twins struggle to get through more than 10 minutes of their three hour Wednesday instructional Zoom. In the classroom, by all accounts, they thrive. This means that my children are only having in-person instruction twice a week. This is not an education, and certainly not an education of the caliber promised by the Winchester Public Schools. The parents, children, and taxpayers in this town deserve a plan with metrics for return to school when it is reasonable, whenever that is. But we must know what our metrics need to be to get back to class. We deserve to know where the goalpost is even if it's very far off in the distance. 
We are all planning now for next year. Many of us, including myself, will likely leave the school district for private or parochial schools. We as taxpayers need to know now whether or not the 21-22 school year will look just like this, with two days a week of school masquerading as a robust education. The only signaling I've seen from anyone on the school committee is on a social media post where one committee member quoted someone as saying, don't expect schools to fully open until there is a cure. A cure for a virus? I guess we will wait forever. I also strongly urge you, the superintendent to, as well, the school committee and the superintendent intended to require choice board materials for children K through five that do not begin and end on a computer screen. We need to spend more time with paper and pencil, work on the dexterity of our youngest learners and away from the glow of computer screen. This needs to be a top-down directive. I have spoken with teachers, our principal, and the superintendent at length about choice boards and engaging our youngest learners. Each suggests I contact the other. Stop passing the buck. These issues need to be addressed district-wide from the superintendent and the school committee on down. Finally, I know tonight's agenda includes a discussion about whether or not the town moves forward with MCAS this year. I support having the MCAS this year. We need to have examination of exactly how much our children will lose over the course of the year. The instruction for the test should not happen during those precious in-school hours, but rather on the remote instructional Wednesdays. It will give us a true representation <coughs> of the quality of the remote education, especially for our K-5 learners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delio. And with that, we will close public comment. I'd like to thank everyone who came to public comment tonight to speak. Um, I, I hear the angst in many of your voices. We are living through an unprecedented in our lives global pandemic, uh, the likes not seen since 1918. And I can hear the angst in your voice. It's in ours as well as we try to move forward in the safest, uh, most effective manner. And uh, we hear you loud and clear. So thank you everyone for coming tonight. And with that, we will move on to reports and discussion items. The first topic is the return school update by Dr. Evans. Uh, Dr. Evans, I will kick it over to you. I know you sent the committee a separate document tonight, so I believe everybody should have that in the committee. Yes, this is a, a recurring uh, agenda item to share with the committee and the wider community uh, issues that um, are important for parents, uh, families, uh, and students to, to know. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, what is on everyone's mind, which is a fairly um, concerning increase in positive COVID-19 cases in our wider community um, and a corresponding number in our schools. Um, and so we have had a number of recently identified cases appear. Um, uh, they are, don't appear to be school spread. Uh, we have not been eligible for the mobile uh, response testing for that reason. There are individual cases within classrooms that uh, appear to have been um, contracted by family um, contact uh, or outside of school contact and not um, <clears throat> spread through our schools, which for which we are grateful and think our six foot distancing and other mitigation measures where we've spent so much time on have been incredibly effective in limiting spread within our community. I'd like to really uh, thank and acknowledge the very, very hard work of the public health personnel, the Board of Health, but especially the um, uh, public health personnel, Jen Murphy, uh, and the public health nurse who uh, work nights, weekends, uh, holidays uh, to answer questions, uh, improve their website, post every day on the town website, which is extremely informative. Um, and uh, work to support our teachers and principals uh, and uh, central office in, in making sure that we're handling each reported positive case appropriately uh, with respect, maintaining confidentiality, but ensuring that uh, foremost in our minds is everyone's um, physical and emotional safety. The Commissioner of Education shared recently that um, 
he feels that the first few weeks of school uh, have um, shown across the Commonwealth there's been very little school spread of COVID-19. Uh, only five schools in the Commonwealth have needed to call on the rapid mobile response testing capacity. However, I'm noticing from the other superintendents with whom I speak that they're seeing more cases generally in their district than they had in the first few weeks. Again, not school spread, community spread. So I'll put in another plea for parents, families, members of our community to social distance, to wear masks, to sacrifice gatherings with people you don't live with so that our students can stay in school. Uh, every uh, positive case that has contacts at school, um, that means teachers and support staff members need to quarantine. If that starts to escalate, uh, we have very, very few substitute teachers who can step in um, and it could mean that we would have to close uh, classrooms or schools simply because it's a personnel issue. And so um, anything that you can do in the wider community to hold each other accountable, to save lives and to save our children's uh, in-person uh, time with us uh, is very important. The district COVID-19 planning and implementation team will meet later this week to look at that data, uh, to review the current um, process for increasing in-person time uh, and also look at the preliminary survey results. Uh, the preliminary survey results, uh, which I will share, uh, except for the um, text, uh, which is uh, personal and it contains a lot of information that would need to be redacted because people's names are mentioned, all of the other information uh, that's taken from the panorama surveys uh, will uh, be shared with the wider community um, it's interesting that parents and students are not on the same page uh, as you, as is often the case. Our students are generally pretty happy and confident with whatever learning model they're in. Um, parents are uh, concerned about their children's academic progress and social emotional well-being as I would expect they would be. Um, so it would be interesting once we close the student surveys and we talk about that at school committee to see what the preliminary uh, results show us. We recently announced that the USDA uh, is subsidizing school lunches throughout the school year until the end of the school year, which is good news for families. Any student who wishes to participate in the lunch program may do so free of charge, um, regardless of identified need. Uh, we would encourage um, families and students to participate if that's convenient for them and they wish to do so. I want to clarify any misconceptions. It's not. Uh, surplus food, it's not donated food, and there's no food that goes to waste. We simply do not charge. Uh, we have a kind of on-demand system where lunches are produced based on student or students ordering them. Um, and so uh, anyone who would like to participate is encouraged to do so, but don't feel compelled to do so. There won't be anything that goes to waste if you do not participate. Um, it's just like any other time when students went up and ordered lunch at the middle or high school or ordered it from their classroom teacher at the elementary school. There obviously are fewer choices now because it's grab and go, but um, it's all uh, free of charge. Uh, we have uh, been conducting our bus registration for K to eight students. It'll conclude next week. We've begun to set routes as expected. Participation appears quite low, but we still have a full week left. Um, we are going to share more information once registration has closed with you. Chrissy Capadano uh, is the assistant principal at Lynch School. She's been appointed the lead administrator for full remote K-5 students and the full, um, the full remote parent advisory group um, with parent, representat parent representation from each of our five elementary schools. Uh, we'll meet with the lead teachers on the 26th. Each K-5 school has started to plan for all school meetings on Wednesdays that include all students who were originally housed in that school if they wish to join, um, plus the hybrid students. Um, so those sort of all school hybrid full remote meetings will be, we hope, monthly for the remainder of the school year and ensure that students feel connected to their home schools. The first meetings will have a Halloween theme and allow students to dress up. And since they're all at home on Wednesdays and it's done via Zoom, everybody can participate. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has announced for this year only that if there are any snow days, we may transform those to remote learning days and they need not be made up at the end of the year. And so that is my plan. 
So that's all I have for return to school updates. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evans. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Marshall? Dr. Evans, a lot of, um, uh, or some of our public commenters reported that they've been in touch with DESI and the commissioner, and I was wondering if you had and heard any feedback from DESI or Commissioner Riley or any concerns? I have not. So, so far we're still under the plan that was submitted to them and, and we're, we're following all of the requirements as has been set with the time and learning and all of that, days in school, et cetera. I believe that we're um, following the plan that we submitted and that was the best plan that we could uh, develop given there are available st uh, staffing and space. Um, there may be a few districts who are able to offer more in-person learning, um, but if you really look in detail at their plans, it's not significantly more hours than we are providing for our students. Um, and many of those districts have uh, lots of extra space and, and significantly more resources to hire additional staff members. And so um, all of the Restrictions that, that led to us developing the plan that we have developed remain in place. Um, and uh, as I have said repeatedly to parents, there's nothing more than I want than to have all students back in person uh, when it is safe to do so. And at this time, we cannot bring them back uh, in person together based on the space that we have. Um, but we will look at uh, other options. We always thought that Wednesdays might be a good option. Um, for more in-person learning, but we were trying to be pretty stringent about separating the cohorts and doing the deep cleaning. The deep cleaning mm -hmm. takes 10 to 12 hours, um, and we're able to do it on Wednesdays, starting on Tuesdays, finishing on Wednesdays, um, and then all day Saturday. Um, it's quite expensive and entails a lot of effort and, and expense, and so should we find that that is not necessary, it might give us more options for Wednesdays. Um, but right now, we have been gr actually grateful for the Wednesday break. It has allowed us to have fewer close contacts in school because students are staying with their cohorts and not, um, it, uh, it gives us another uh, day to, to trace contacts. And, and so it has been helpful, but we do need a plan to bring students back more in person, particularly at the K to five level. Um, I recognize that we'll work on it. Um, and and you have been working on it, in fact. It's not like that was off to the side somewhere. That's part of all of the planning you've been doing. Yeah, no, I know that, but I, but I think um, what I think that some people in the community may not recognize is that it entails a, a lot more planning and negotiations with our unions. Um, and, uh, and we have to be going in a positive direction in terms of transmissions before we could right. consider bringing students back for any more in-person time. And people keep mentioning other school districts doing things better and differently and more and more. Can you talk about, because you speak to all those superintendents every day, um, can you talk about some of the um, differences in each school district since they are publicly run, how, how they function differently that they might have less students or more space or more money? So, so uh, I did meet with uh, 11 other superintendents this morning um, as part of our same collaborative board and asked them to share with me any of their return to school plans. And none of them have de developed more specific plans at this point mm -hmm. because they're, they've, like we, have brought the students back for as much time as they have available given the current parameters. And so there are a few small districts with small numbers of elementary students who are able to bring students back for more time. Mm -hmm. For example, I believe uh, Weston Public Schools can bring their elementary students back for more time, more mornings, half days. Um, the reality is when you have many fewer students, you may have larger buildings, you may have space for that, you may have additional mm -hmm. staff members. Uh, Weston spends per pupil over $20,000 a pupil, we spend 14. If we spent at the same rate, I'd have $51 million in my budget each and every year. And I could do a lot with $51 million. On top of what you have. Right. On top of what I have, correct. So it'd be a $100 million budget rather right. than the $50 million right. we spent. So I, you know, in some, in some cases, the, the resources make a big difference. Right. Um, but in our case, because we are growing in enrollment, and despite, I'll talk later, despite the uh, 
movement of some students, especially at the elementary level, to private schools for this year, we're still above projections in many um, grade levels um, or close to it. And so we've, we've add, we continue to add students. We continue mm -hmm. to be overcrowded. Um, we continue to use each and every available space. And so we don't have a lot of space to bring uh, more students back in person, unfortunately. And so, but the 25 member COVID-19 planning and implementation team will consider every option. I think the uh, shift to some in person on Wednesdays is the first recommendation and then we'll see where mm -hmm. else we land. Um, similarly, I'm hearing loud and clear about the choice boards. Mm -hmm. um, I met with the coordinators who are um, working with teachers to develop the choice boards and as they have demonstrated them to me, I think some of them are excellent, mm -hmm. um, but clearly they're not connecting with students and, and parents and so we need to take another look at that. Um, but in general, uh, we all want the same thing. Right. It's just uh, there needs to be some recognition that our first priority is to keep everybody safe and healthy, mm -hmm. and our second priority is to educate them more in person, and we will do that when we're able to do it. So two more things, Brian, if it's okay. Absolutely. Um, yes, first of all, um, people continue to refer to our community as being affluent. That might be true in the private households, but in terms of our tax base, we are skewed to having to only spend 14,000 per pupil per year, whereas Weston can go up to 20 some thousand. So it's not like we can ask our community, hey, can you dump a lot more money into our district, given the restrictions on how much taxes we do collect, um, and all of the laws that we are subject to, federal and state and local, um, on what we can and can't do in terms of a public institution, how we can and can't raise money. So it's not fair to just say that, oh, there's all these households that can give a lot more money. We are given the budget that we're given at town meeting and we can't really, we apply to every grant we can and we do what we can to bring in more funds, but the money is what it is. It's not based on the affluence of our community. Is that? Fair to say? Uh, so there are two main sources of funding for schools. One is state funding. Uh, we get a little bit from the federal government in terms of grants specific for certain purposes. Uh, and then the taxpayers fund the rest. And I think our taxpayers have been generous given that we're not like Burlington. We don't have a large commercial base. Right. Um, and um, I was thrilled and humbled that so many people voted for the override mm -hmm. to increase our budget. Um, and we are highly efficient in our use of budget, but the um, challenge comes when you're in a pandemic year and your expenses increase, but your bu budget doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and your personnel expenses increase dramatically because of teachers who need to take kids. They're not able to work in person or they need to take care of their children. Um, and there aren't additional sources of funding. I can't cut expenses right. and I can't raise revenue. And so public schools, unlike private schools, right. um, uh, it's a different, means of operation right. um, and so there are inequities right some towns can spend nearly double right. what we spend um, for each student mm -hmm. um, but it's not a matter of will or um, uh, th that our taxpayers are not generous right. they are generous right. but other towns have chosen to tax themselves at much higher rates or they have a commercial base or they have a commercial right. base and so that's the that's the reality and, and we can't, um, we can't ignore that. And right. it's not changed since the time that our initial plan was established. Right, right, and, and you and Ellen are able to draw as much as you can out of every dollar we receive. And my final point is that because we are a public institution that has to follow certain rules and regulations, especially as they come down from DESE and CDC and all of these other institutions, and because we're following them with mask wearing, social distancing, six feet, recess outside, spread around and everything, that could be the reason we are keeping school transmission rates so low. It's because we're following all of these guidance to the letter mm -hmm. and as much as we can. And so that could be the explanation for why transmission rates are mm -hmm. so non-existent in our school right now, correct? Right, well, we don't know of any. We don't know of any. Right. And so it's, it's not a good time right now to move 
away from any of these guidelines, as strict as they are, like the six feet apart and all of that, it's not a good time to test our theory and expose our older staff members who have bravely come into the building to teach our students face to face twice, two times, um, two days a week. Four days for them. Four days for them, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to them that we then stress the system even more than it is stressed right now and create a possible public health crisis. So right now we're maintaining this positive experience for students at the health, public health guidelines. And so we're doing our job, but there are things you are saying that we can do to help teachers provide more curriculum and more instruction. Even though I personally have two elementary school kids and they find the, pro the whole process enjoyable. I am lucky that I'm a stay-at-home parent, um, and so I do get to put in a lot more effort than working parents, but um, you're still working on it, and it's a collaborative effort between our union members, um, and, and they've been very helpful and easy to work with, and they are all looking for the best interest in our children. Is that a fair assessment of how the relationship has been? No, I agree with you. I, I think parents are absolutely right to say, what's the plan? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I have agreed that uh, we need to firm up a plan and uh, have some specific <coughs> guidelines for when that plan will be implemented and negotiate that with our four union groups. Um, and all of that is going to be placed into operation. Mm -hmm. um, but I do agree that the next few months are going to be challenging mm -hmm. as we have holidays and travel right. and likely we'll have more cases. And so it may be um, more challenging for the winter months than any of us would like to mm -hmm. see. Um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't have a plan. At some point, we will all be together again. Mm -hmm. And we hope that that point is sometime during Soon. the school year. Right. So I just want to conclude by saying I've heard all of the public comments. I really understand all of the pressure we're under as parents, as community members, but I also want to acknowledge all of the factors that you have to consider day in and day out, and that not every student is the same. And so you are looking at multiple layers, including special mm -hmm. education, facilities, staff, et cetera, and I commend you and the staff for doing such an incredible job around this, and we're all doing the best we can. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Marchant. Are there additional questions or comments from the committee? I have a couple Ms. questions. Ms. Bergstrom. If you don't mind, Brian. Absolutely. So, Dr. Evans, Could I'd you like pull your microphone as close as you sure, can? Sure, absolutely. Just double check. Um, I'd like to go back to, um, we heard from a very eloquent fifth grader at the beginning of our evening, and um, I was happy to see in your messages and hear you speak about tonight about surveys that are actually being delivered to the students as well as the parents. And um, we heard her represent her, her own views that um, the choice birds are difficult for her and some issues with recess and lunch and not being able to talk and mm -hmm. things like that. Will those student surveys then come back to the return to school working group to look at some of those issues that might arise, not only from Chloe, but from some of our other elementary school students as well as the middle and high school students? Sure. Um, the student surveys um, are not, that's not closed yet, so not all the students have completed them. Uh, when I took a look at the preliminary surveys, I was really pleased to see that most students are not having any difficulty with the masking or social distancing per se, following the rules. They're not finding it difficult. Um, and most of them in the comments, when, they, when we said, what, what can we do to improve, most of them said nothing, it's great. <laughs> uh, we had a few comments. Um, we are being super strict, at, as you know, with lunches and mask breaks um, because those are the events that f with adults have led to spread. Um, and it stinks because at middle school especially, the one thing you want to do is be with your friends. Right. At elementary school, you want to be with your friends, but at least they're nearby. But at middle school, your friends may not be nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and the assigned seating is uh, very difficult, particularly for middle school students. But we need to have assigned seating for contact tracing and, um, and we need to not have students talking while they have their masks on, off because that could be a spread. And so we're just trying to be extra vigilant. And I know it's really um, boring to sit at a table by yourself and not socialize. That's what kids really look forward to. However, out on the playgrounds, kids are running around. They are 
enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. um, public health and, and our nurse leader have asked us to pull back on some of the games that we're playing mm -hmm. where students might be too close to each other, like soccer. So we're doing you know, kickball, we're further apart. Um, so I think there is some concern with the community spread that we want to really be hyper vigilant about keeping students um, apart from one another. Um, so the, the at home, you know, I, I, and I know Jen Allen Emma is working really closely with the coordinators on the choice boards. Um, what we need to do is connect the choice boards more specifically and communicate the purpose and give more feedback on some of the things that are um, helpful on the choice boards. And I think teachers will start to do that more on the Wednesday full class um, and also um, start to take some feedback from students and sharing things that they're doing from the choice boards. Some of the activities on the choice boards are start on the computer but then have nothing to do with the computer. You know, it's just the instructions there. What we're trying to avoid is sending, you know, lots of paper that people have to shuffle, especially if they have several students. So, so whatever decision we make is not going to please everybody, but um, I know that we're hearing the feedback and the student feedback is not really specific on the choice boards. Um, there is feedback from high school students that they're feeling overwhelmed by the academic pressures, mm -hmm. that there's no de-escalation of expectations, that the teachers are really plowing through the curriculum yep. and that the students, I'm hearing almost no critiques of middle and high school, um, even though ironically they have exactly the same amount of time as the elementary students, but um, I think that there's a recognition that parents need to support <coughs> elementary students right. to a far greater degree and it's extremely stressful for those families. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, but it's not an easy problem to solve. Well, and especially for the K-2 students, I would imagine that many of them are just beginning to read, so it's hard to even figure out how to navigate a choice board when you can't read the choice they, they board. They need a parent to support them the whole way through, which is, right. which is, which is very challenging. Um, the, the other thing I'd like to just point out in case um, I forget to, to remind you about this is, uh, we, uh, I heard a plea for MCAS for assessment purposes. We actually don't find MCAS useful for assessment purposes because it comes after the students have moved to the next grade. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no faith that the MCAS test that they'll give us, which by the way has to be done in person with a right. teacher supervising, which could make it really difficult for remote families right. um, to do that because we don't have we don't have the technology or the facilities or the, or the supervision to do that well. Um, so I'm really perplexed as to how the state thinks that full remote districts are going to be able to do the MCAS. However, um, we are now doing all of our usual assessments. We're doing our benchmark reading assessments, benchmark writing assessments. We'll do the uh, everyday math assessments. So, so when the conferences happen, parents should have a good idea about where their children stand um, in relation to our academic benchmarks, which haven't changed even though our number of hours of instruction have reduced from a typical year. What the teachers are finding with the very small in-person classes um, in the hybrid model is that they're able to give individual students lots more attention and they're able to move through the curriculum at a faster pace because um, the students um, are able to get their needs met, whereas um, if, you're, if you're in a class of 22 all day every day, sometimes it's easy to have some students um, who need more support, they're not a bit, they're, the teacher is spread more thinly. And so I think in some respects, we're trying to look for the silver linings. Um, so plenty of assessment happening. Um, if parents wanted to look at the curriculum, the prioritized standards, it's all on the website, K to 12, um, on the COVID-19 website, just click on the curriculum link. Um, and there are actually some assessments that we're doing that are performance assessments right there embedded in the documents. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at those yet, but if people wanted to look at those. The prioritized standards are in there um, in terms of what we expect students to know and be able to do to have the core skills to move on to the next grade level. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased with the work that teachers have done in that regard. I think we're all on the same page. I can be quite sure that there's equitable access to, to the curriculum for all students, K to five, in a way that in the past, uh, there may have been some differences from school to school because we did not have such a well-defined curriculum scope and sequence. And so, um, so I'm, I'm pleased with those documents and we encourage people to look at those. Um, and then my other, I just had a follow-up to one of Zena's about the instructional hours. 
Um, in a typical classroom year, we, cut, we count instructional hours sort of as the hours students are in school minus recess, correct? Mm -hmm. and, and lunch. Mm -hmm. And lunch. And that time during the school day has some direct instruction by the teacher, has some independent work, mm -hmm. which is similar to what students are getting on choice boards now. Right. Um, so could you talk a little bit, because I'm not sure from some of the comment, public comments that all of, the, um, all of the public commenters necessarily understand in a typical school year how instructional hours are developed and counted. Sure. So uh, we think students learn through a wide variety of experiences, not just when the teachers are in front of them teaching a lesson or, or working with a small group of students, but that our students learn how to make independent choices, how to collaborate with others. And in a typical K-5 classroom, there's actually very little direct instruction that's whole class. There are many lessons, um, but the vast majority of the time, students are working uh, at, at, in stations independently or with other students, um, and often uh, <coughs> supported by other people like reading specialists or special educators or EL teachers, English like learner teachers, um, depending on their needs. And so, um, when parents have asked me, can't we just put a camera in and have our children watch, I say that's not the way we teach. You would see the teacher moving around and working with different groups at different times. Um, and so that's the way our students have learned. And it's been extremely successful. All of our elementary schools are among the top performers in the state as measured on standardized tests, if that's you know, one measure. Um, and so even in a typical day, students would be doing, depending on their grade level, developmentally appropriate activities like free play, or um, they'd be doing a lot of independent reading. That's not direct instruction, that's independent reading. And so I think you know, the expectation is um, that all districts are going to uh, provide access to the curriculum, but it's going to look different from district to district depending on the resources and the needs of the students. And last year when we did um, remote learning, I know we had some parents that requested things on paper instead of electronically. Is there any ability for parents to receive anything in print instead of electronically this year as well? Sure, we, I mean, we've talked about that with the principals and um, that may be one way parent organizations can help us out by you know, producing and distributing. The, the big issue is we don't want lots of parents interacting with school personnel. Right. Correct. Um, and so pickup is a little bit challenging. But we've been distributing materials all along. The full remote teachers are distributing materials pretty mm -hmm. regularly. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and you saw at the high school they distributed textbooks and middle school they distributed books. So there is a capacity to distribute. Um, and certainly if parents don't have access to a printer or want a lot of the activities that are on the choice boards are you're expected to print something out or use a piece of paper and draw mm -hmm. or write or explore or um, create and um, so if parents need help with that they should just contact their classroom teacher and we'll so work. if they wanted to receive it as a packet for example mm -hmm. each week if they're a hybrid student instead of receiving it electronically they, they might they, be able to do they that. might be able to do that and they should talk to their principals then I think they should put it happen? through the classroom they... teacher first okay. and then the teachers have common planning time every week and they can bring those requests forward and see if we can, um, particularly the choice boards, we mm -hmm. can divide and conquer and have someone else copy it so we can free the teachers up. Because our teachers are teaching all day without a break, mm -hmm. um, that um, their, their time to plan is m more limited than it would right. be typically. And my last just quick question is, Chrissy Capadano is the lead administrator for the K-5 remote. Can you explain to the committee a little bit about how her job description has changed is she still going to be putting in time as the, the uh, Lynch assistant principal, or has she entirely moved over to administrating for a K-5 remote? How's that time going to be split? So you might remember and what you imagine her doing, because yes. this is a new job description, and we haven't seen that. Right. So this is a stipend, and it, so it's not um, her full-time job. She's still her full-time job is still assistant principal at Lynch. However. Lynch School has the largest um, elementary population and typically is the only school with a full-time assistant principal. At the other schools, there is a half-time assistant principal. Um, and um, so with the um, pretty significant percentage of Lynch population being full remote, the need for a full-time principal and a full-time assistant principal is lessened because there are fewer people to supervise. 
um, and fewer students to um, help manage. And so we thought she'd be um, a good person because she was a master teacher at the elementary level. She knows a lot of the families. And uh, her main job is to coordinate the activities of the lead teachers. There's one teacher for each grade, mm -hmm. full remote, uh, to meet with the five principals and be sure that they develop activities like the um, all school meeting or other ways to connect students to their home school. She's also fielding requests. We have more students requesting to come from full remote back to hybrid. Um, and uh, she is uh, uh, going to produce a newsletter for the full remote um, families to be sure that they're um, connecting with uh, uh, other full remote families and just share similar information. Um, but part of uh, her job is going to be to meet regularly with the parent advisory group and the lead teachers and um, take suggestions from those parent representatives and see what we can do to make the full remote experience um, as uh, stress-free and as um, productive as possible. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Bergstrom. Are there additional questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Nixon, I just wanted, are you there? Yes, you are there. Um, yeah. I'll go can with you, you Mr. Okay? Yes, I'll yeah, go with you, great. Mr. Nixon. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I, I, I just had a few thoughts. I, I'm glad I had my phone on mute when Ms. Marchant was uh, first speaking because I was cheering for her when she addressed the wealth issue in Winchester. Um, I think she did a fantastic job. There's just a few points I wanted to make in addition to those. Um, I think at a previous school committee meeting, oh my gosh, this was probably before we opened school, we heard during public comment <clears throat> what districts like Bill Ricca, I think it was Brookline, Newton, and Weston were doing in terms of how they were deploying their resources. And I did some quick back of napkin calculations. And my memory was if we had the level of funding per pupil that Bill Ricca has, we'd have, I think, almost $6 million more in our budget. So the issue um, is not that the Winchester School Committee uh, doesn't work very hard to advocate for our students and our teachers and our staff every year. We do. Um, our numerator, which is our operating budget, grows every year. Our challenge has been the denominator that also continues to grow. It keeps up, and sometimes it grows at a faster pace than the numerator. If the numerator is our operating budget, the denominator is the number of students we have in the district. And we actually heard during public comment tonight from a number of parents who specifically referred to the fact that they moved to Winchester with certain expectations. And so they're not alone. Um, and I'm one of them many, many years ago. So we work very hard to increase our budget. And then when we feel like we're sort of running out of room in terms of our um, ability to tax, every once in a while we, we take up this issue of an operating override, which Ms. Marchand addressed as well. And I think we're all very thankful for that. But I would, you know, the committee knows, and I'd remind those listening in tonight, that two things. We are running a district tonight with less of a budget than what we voted initially in January. We did not get the budget we initially voted for. The budget that we developed was not developed with any concept of a global pandemic. And the operating override, which we are all extremely thankful for, not only on an operating basis, but for many of the capital projects I spoke to earlier tonight, that operating override was for $2 million less than what the working group determined we needed. So we, I, I find that over the years we always struggle, and it's a difficult conversation to have, between what it is we feel we really need and we sort of balance the, let's say, <clears throat> the ability of many in Winchester to pay. So I appreciate the point that Ms. Marchant made. Is we do have some very wealthy families in Winchester, but they're not necessarily representative of the entire town. So <clears throat> it, it's a it's an ongoing conversation. It's an important one to have. It's not an easy one to have. But I feel like Winchester just does an outstanding job when you look at our results and the kind of people that, that we're able to keep and that Ms. Kirby is able to hire each year. When you look at what we spend per pupil, it's really incredible. I want to just make a couple of comments with respect to back to school. Um, again, reminding those who maybe spoke at public comment tonight who were not with us in August back when we had six-hour school committee meetings at a time. We submitted a return to school plan to the state, and we amended that plan specifically to call for the uh, public health director and the chair of the Board of Health to join us 
at our school committee table no less than every three weeks to look at our demographic study area to help us develop metrics and triggers that would change our operating model. And specifically, we said both to make the model more restrictive, meaning we get COVID infections, we're going to throttle back, we're going to start shutting down cohorts or schools. But we also said we wanted some discussion and input around how to relax the operating model. And for those who were chiming in on public comment tonight who may be frustrated, I just want to be clear that it was only two evening meetings ago, I believe, the chair can correct me, when the Board of Health came forward with, I think, a, a terrific document with some guidelines for the superintendent based on different triggers, different scenarios that might play out in our district in terms of infection and where they are and how many and so forth. And this was really all about some guidance on what we might need to do to restrict our operating model, which is absolutely the appropriate thing to look at first. Why? Because we were going back to school. And, and we wanted to be sure that our model was sound. As important as it is for me, I think for all of us on the school committee and our administration, that our, our first priority is articulated in the mission, which we heard about tonight during public comment. It's all about education, but I want to remind people that, that we're not public health experts. Three of us on the school committee are in medical marriages, but none of us have uh, medical degrees. The superintendent's not a medical expert, a public health expert. And so our, our really our first priority is to keep kids and teachers and our staff safe, always. And so our intent in opening up school with the model we developed was to monitor and see how things were going. I want to, I want to second the comment um, that I believe the superintendent or the chair made tonight. I think the Board of Health is doing a great job on the COVID dashboard. They add more and more information. I think, uh, Mr. Vernalia, the, 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 the suggestion you made at the last evening meeting has actually been incorporated. There's even more information now that's charted on the dashboard. And I find these conversations with them to be very helpful. Um, I, I want to just also then recognize that it was only at our last evening meeting where we began to scratch the surface of loosening the restrictions on the operating model. We had one representative at the table that night who even said, we shouldn't have the discussion hinging on the discovery and the sort of distribution of the vaccine. That's really, that's interesting and some might say that's provocative. I'm glad that that actually was voiced because I think there's a fundamental truth to this that for every parent we heard at public comment tonight who feel strongly, they have a peer in Winchester on the other end of the spectrum. Um, this is not an easy conversation to have, and there's no decision that this school committee can make that's going to please everyone. There are many parents in this town who have zero interest in sending their kids to school until there's a vaccine that's proven and it's widely available and it's been administered. So the conversation has begun, and we were serious about having it when we amended our back-to-school plan. <coughs> And I, I, I really thank everybody, everybody on the Board of Health um, who's been sort of working so hard on that. And I would remind folks, I know, I know the Board of Health has seen an uptick in uh, public comment, which they probably rarely got before. Um, but if there are parents who have questions uh, about um, you know, school operations as it pertains directly to public health questions, they can certainly reach out to the Board of Health by email. And they can certainly engage with them in public comment. The last, the last point I want to make, it's actually a request of you, Mr. Chairman, because I feel like recently we've gotten a lot of emails from parents that are actually addressed to the entire school committee. I wondered if you might just take a moment to make a public service announcement and, and explain to those listening in tonight why it is that, that the entire school committee is not responding by email, uh, a note about open meeting law and sort of our, our, our practice, which is that certainly the superintendent can respond and typically the chair would respond for the school committee. If you wouldn't mind, just try to do that in a quick elevator speech. I would appreciate it. Absolutely, Mr. Uh, Nix. I had, a quest I, I had a question for Dr. Evans once you do that. Well, I, um, I'd like to respond to two of the things you said. First, absolutely you're correct that if um, we welcome public emails to our board and in fact, uh, sending them to Dr. Evans and each and every one of us is, is the right way to do it so we can all see what you're writing. However, we are not 
allowed by law to respond to you and keep everybody else on that email. So uh, that would be a violation of open meeting law. So anytime I respond to an email, I am allowed to include one other member of the committee, and often I'll include the vice chair, Ms. Bolognese, but I will not include the rest of the committee. So if there's a back and forth discussion and you keep on adding in the rest of the committee, which is totally your right to do, uh, I will keep on taking off the rest of the committee as the responses go back because uh, I, I'm not allowed to share that. You're welcome to share any email I sent back to you to the rest of the committee because the open meeting law only impacts the committee, not you. You as members of the public are welcome, do, are not subject to open meeting law. Uh, before your question, I wanted to respond to something you said about the Board of Health meeting. The next Board of Health meeting is Monday the 26th at 5 p.m. and we as a committee have been invited there. There was um, not time or at the time we were preparing this uh, agenda, uh, reason for us to have invite them to this meeting. I think things have changed in the community and we've been invited to attend their meeting. The chair and the vice chair intend to, uh, intend to, intend to attend that meeting and if any of the rest of the committee would like to attend, I will post it as a meeting so that we can attend as many of us who would like to. So uh, if you will get back to me, members of the committee, so that um, by email tomorrow, I will then reach back out to uh, uh, Dr. Batari and Ms. Murphy and tell them that we would like to double post it or leave it, uh, if it's just the two of us, we do not need to post, so. Brian, can I follow up with something at that too? Yes. Dr. Evans referred to the back to school team, the 25 member team that the district has in place that will also be taking up issues of return to school and metrics. And I just wanted to remind the community that that is also a multidisciplinary team that, in, that includes members of public health and uh, physicians in the community, as well as um, school <coughs> nurses and um, uh, teaching staff representatives, parent representatives. So um, it is not just a um, district team that is internal, but rather both an internal and an external facing team. So when we talk about that committee also taking up issues like this, it is also a well-represented community group. That's a very good point. Thank you for pointing that out. And I would add on that there are two members of this committee on that committee because, again, as per open meeting law, we can't have three meeting members or it would be a school committee meeting, so, and we'd have to post it, so it is not. So Ms. Bergstrom and myself attend those meetings. And I believe, Mr. Nixon, you had an additional question uh, did, for I, Dr. Evans. I, I had a question, I, I did, I had a question for the superintendent, <clears throat> uh, but Ms. Bergstrom's comment just reminds me, I, I should probably explain. I, I, the really, the, one of the one of the key reasons behind amending that back to school plan to 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 invite the, our public health representatives to come and speak with us at the table was so that that was a way we could have these important conversations in the public square because uh, the the the, discuss, the 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 individuals the discussions Ms. Bergstrom just mentioned, which is really an incredible amount of heavy lifting isn't happening in public meetings over Zoom. I mean, it, it, it almost can't. Can you imagine how cumbersome that might be? So this was really a way for us to kind of make good on an obligation to keep our parents and constituents informed as to what's going on. So yes, my very quick question for Dr. Evans. At our last evening meeting, I had asked you if you had yet decided who the principal representatives were on the remote advisory group. And I think you, you had said you were hoping to appoint at least two you have given a tremendous amount of information to the school committee by email. I apologize if you've emailed it and I've missed it, um, but I wasn't aware who those principal representatives were. Have those been assigned and can you share who they are? Uh, actually, uh, Chrissy Capadano, uh, who's the uh, vice principal, assistant principal at Lynch School, is the um, administ lead administrator for the full remote. Um, she is coordinating and meeting regularly with all five of the elementary principals to be sure uh, that um, uh, all services are coordinated appropriately. So, so she, I think you previously announced she was going to have that role, but we had discussed um, actually having elementary principals participate as well. Is that is that is that something you're not 
you're not comfortable doing or that we just don't have availability of folks to serve in that role? No, they all, all five of them take responsibility for uh, certain grade levels and are supervising and um, coordinating activities for that, that grade level. Uh, so all five elementary principals are deeply involved in full remote as well as hybrid, but Chrissy is the lead administrator and the first point of contact. So the elementary remote principals will be reporting to Chrissy Capadano, and then Chrissy will be reporting back. Chrissy will meet with the remote, with all five principals, uh, and with the lead teachers, uh, and with the uh, parent advisory group, and coordinating all the activities for the full remote for K to five. Okay, so then just, it, it, as I think we said at the last meeting was, you know, in a typical year, we would say to parents, if you have concerns about something going on in the classroom, you obviously don't go to the superintendent or school committee first. You start with your classroom teacher. And if, if, you, if you're not sort of satisfied with the response and you still have lingering concerns, you go to your building principal. So in, in this instance for remote families, not those who are on the advisory group, but really all remote families, if they're having concerns about something that's going on with their students, they, they the, the contact is then to Ms. Capadano and, it, and it's, it's not necessarily to principals? Right. Uh, what I have seen remote parents doing is actually um, going to Ms. Capadano, but also copying the principal uh, with whom they feel the most connection. Sometimes it's their home principal and not the assigned grade level principal. Um, what I have said to full remote parents is go to the person you feel most comfortable. Either your assigned grade level principal who uh, you, they may not know that person, um, but uh, those uh, principals have reached out to the families uh, um, under their uh, supervision. Um, but in general, Chrissy is trying to build strong connections with families. She'll be writing the newsletter. She sent an email out to introduce herself to all the full remote families. Um, and obviously, she was at Morocco and Lynch. She knows a lot of the families already, um, having been uh, in the district for a long time. So we felt that that she had the most capacity to help coordinate activities, but none of the principals wanted to be fully removed from it. They all want to be equally involved and invested in both full remote and hybrid. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Can I just make one Ms. request and follow up real quick to Mr. Nixon? Um, we've talked a lot about return to school metrics, and I think those are really important, but I think one of our other public commenters also, and Mr. Nixon's bringing up some of the concerns of remote families. Can we make sure that in the plans that we're creating about return to school, that we also address what will happen to our remote learning academy? And um, as we move forward, so remote learning parents are equally aware of what our plans are regarding that through the end of the school year. Um, and also um, make specific plans about uh, remote learners access to high stakes testing if we are still required to do MCAS and if they need to take SAT here in Winchester. Happy Thank to. you, Ms. Bergstrom. Additional questions or comments from the committee? I had a couple. Ms. Bolognese? Um, Please do put, pull the mic close to your mouth yes. because the masks sort of obscure yes. our Muffled. voice. That's not the right word, obscure. Are they? Muffle. Muffle. Mute. Yes. Um, Dr. Evans, I was just wondering if you could comment on what's the timeline that the district COVID-19 team is looking at for reassessing a return to, uh, or reopening plan? I, like I think that's a, that's a really complicated mm -hmm. um, question, and there are a lot of variables that are playing right. into it. I, I am going to propose that we try to have a plan by the beginning of December, okay. um, and everyone's going to have to be flexible and adaptable as we learn more about the course of the virus in our community and the impact mm -hmm. on our staff members. <clears throat> um, you have to remember that we have nearly 700 employees, um, many of whom have live in other uh, parts of the Commonwealth, have their own children, um, may be exposed and need to be absent, et cetera, for a variety of reasons. Um, or may have children who are quarantining because they have been exposed in their own <coughs> districts. We are finding the personnel aspects of managing the hybrid and the full remote with the same staffing and level of resources extremely challenging, um, especially in respect to hiring support staff, ISS and ESPs, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the people who would normally take those positions are certified teachers and they've been hired as teachers or they're uh, doing leave of absence replacements. 
and there just are no candidates. We are, we are advertising and advertising and finding no candidates. And so um, it has been um, extremely challenging to manage the personnel aspects of this. I would say in response to um, Ms. Bergstrom's question about what happens to full remote, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we're still following the DESE guidelines, which require us to offer an in-person option and a full remote option. Um, and one of the things that makes planning the transition to more in-person time more complicated is because there are so many individual student schedules and so many staff members who are supporting both full remote and hybrid mm -hmm. at the same time that a change in any part of the schedule by an hour really makes a huge difference and will require lots of students to change teachers or schedules. It's not as easy as it looks on paper. Um, we have very limited <coughs> flexibility. It used to be that most people who worked in an elementary school only worked in that elementary school and now we have people working across the district, hundreds of them. Uh, we have many staff members who for um, medical reasons can only work remotely um, and so um, <coughs> They, if we brought more people back in person, it would require more, hiring more personnel. This is not to make excuses and not to say we won't make a plan, but it is going to be a complex plan and will require some time to implement mm -hmm. and will require additional resources. And so um, we'll just have to uh, use all the uh, best thinking of the volunteers who serve on the COVID-19 planning and implementation team the building COVID-19 planning and implementation team, the district-wide health and safety committee, et cetera. We have lots of groups working on all aspects of this all the time. Um, and we're fortunate to have public health involved in several of the committees. And so they've been an invaluable resource. I also am uh, consulting regularly with the Middlesex League superintendents. There's you know, a dozen of those. And then uh, the SEAM collaborative uh, superintendents, and, and that's not the same group. Um, I'm also in a consultancy with Teachers 21, and, and the commissioner calls superintendents regularly, generally once a week or so, to update us on things happening at the state level. So we're all working hard to stay informed, learn from each other, share resources. Uh, <coughs> this is an incredibly challenging time, and we're doing our very best, and, and I appreciate the recognition, especially for our teachers, who are going above and beyond and working so very hard for our students every day. Um, another question, uh, you had mentioned that the student and family surveys uh, would, uh, survey results would be going to the district COVID-19 team um, by this Thursday and that um, we would be able to see like the summarized results. I'm just going um, to um, give the summaries of the mm -hmm. questions that uh, right. can appear on a graph or that are easily, mm -hmm. so that I don't, I, I, 800 individual text responses need a lot of redaction before I share mm -hmm. them with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, we can at central office summarize the gist of mm -hmm. what is happening in the, in the responses. There are lots of responses that are pretty similar to each other. It's very interesting to see, and, and again, I will share with the, uh, with both the school committee and um, the um, COVID-19 plan planning Im implementation team, just to do a snapshot and see how we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, there are no surprises. We already knew, I already knew before public comment tonight, you know, what, why people were unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, they have a right to be unhappy. This is a global pandemic and it's stressing us all to our maximum capacity. And if we could easily do what they ask, I would have already done it. And so what's frustrating for me and for them is that what appears on the surface to be easy is always much more complex underneath. Mm -hmm. And um, we all <coughs> need to um, uh, be very uh, thoughtful about next steps. So I'll, I will share the um, surveys um, and, uh, and we'll try to disaggregate some of the data mm -hmm. at some point as well. But this will just be the, you know, a mm -hmm. quick summary. Right. Is there a timeline for when we, uh, when we would see the data or when you'd share it more publicly? Um, I'll, I'll post it on the website as soon as the surveys okay. close, the raw data, but I'm, okay. you know, in terms of an analysis, probably uh, next meeting. Next meeting, okay, great. Take a look at that. There's an additional survey that's going to staff members that hasn't gone out yet. Oh uh, yes, that's right. Thank you. And just the, the last is a comment. Um, I think we'd also we'd heard a little bit about, um, or we'd heard about the choice boards and then um, packets of homework. And I know we, um, we have there are varying opinions on packets of homework um, and their value. Um, 
I do think that in a pandemic situation, um, there's a need to be I, in so many aspects, every aspect of the pandemic and education in a pandemic, um, we just need to be flexible and open to different um, things. And even if it's something that we don't typically support, then I think there is some merit to having packets of homework um, if parents are uh, if parents are interested in it. And just in our personal experience, um, I have a third grader, and. W w We've been receiving a packet of inform a packet of homework that's very focused on the topics uh, that the students are studying in class, and we're quite grateful for it. Uh, this is just my personal experience, um, but it's just been helpful to focus um, my elementary school student on things to work on, um, and also in the full remote Wednesday. Uh, to focus the class on what topics that they're working on, and then also for our remote days, things for the student, for our elementary school student to focus on. Um, and I, I guess also commensurate with that is uh, the communication from the teachers. I think that is really important and key to um, keeping parents just abreast of what topics are being focused on in class. And um, our experience has been good with that. So I'm very appreciative for that. So good. it's just helpful to have something concrete, be able to write. Excellent. Thank you for Thank that you. feedback. And uh, I'll, you know, I'll share the request for the packets with the elementary um, coordinators and principals and see you know, whether, mm -hmm. whether it entails just printing some things out from the choice boards mm -hmm. and, and helping to focus. Mm -hmm. The key thing that we would do typically in a classroom um, is differentiate homework um, for, to meet the needs of the student. And so we would want to continue to do that and not just have sort of general grade level homework that's either too easy or too difficult. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that not all families have the capacity to do more work on the at-home days than they are already are doing. Um, they're working, uh, mm -hmm. their, um, their children are engage for a couple of hours or an hour and a half in their special subjects. Um, many of them have other sessions scheduled on those days for English learner or special education mm -hmm. services or counseling services. And so while some more typical learners may not be doing as much on those at-home days, there are many students who are fully engaged. And there are a fairly large number of students who are um, <coughs> have four, four or four and a half full days of learning because mm -hmm. of their IEPs. Um, and so, uh, you know, not every child's experience is the same because not every child needs the same. And mm -hmm. so, um, but we'll take all the feedback and I'll speak with Dr. Ellen Emma and see, you know, um, whether we can move in a direction that would assist families uh, that will also help students learn that is, uh, uh, Choice based and not and, and differentiated and not just a packet that could apply to any student at that grade level. Right. And the standards are on our website where? On mm -hmm. the COVID 19. We so, know, but the community <laughs> might not. So on the, hmm. you hit the COVID 19 button on the first page and they're on that, um, they're on that COVID 19 website. It says curriculum guides. And curriculum then you guides. can get the curriculum guides not only for each grade level, but each subject and specialist. Correct. Correct. Yep. Great. Thank you. So sure. if people are really curious what their kids are expected to know or learn mm -hmm. this year, if they're concerned about their academics, they can look there. Right. I would encourage them to click on the links because the prioritized standards are a link. And yep. also the mm -hmm. um, uh, performance assessments, uh, there are two for every subject at every grade level. They should click on those and get a sense for what we think is a good assessment versus a standardized test, which doesn't tell us as much. Right. So it has a lot of great information. I thank Dr. Ellen Emma for thank getting you. that up there. Thank you, Dr. Ellen Emma. <laughs> Do Dr. Evans, if I may ask, uh, I have a moderately lengthy comment followed okay. by a question. Thanks and for setting that up. The comment <laughs> is that um, the health department is, has, does have this great COVID dashboard. And if we look at the dashboard, we can see the number of COVID cases. At the bottom of the chart, there's a chart. There were six cases in, after the peak in April. There were six cases in June, six in July, eight in August, and 12 in September. Around, uh, I guess it must have been July or August, they also started a mapping where they showed each town and they color-coded them. 
either with no color, which indicated fewer than five cases in the town, um, green, which was less than four cases um, over a two-week period per 100,000 uh, residents, which in a town like Winchester is about 12 over those 14 days, about 12 cases over those 14 days. Um, yellow is four to eight, which is about 13 to 26 cases. And above 26 goes into the red area um, on those charts. Uh, Winchester was very fortunate over the summer when we had very few cases that we were uncolored for mm -hmm. uh, many months. Then we became green, mm -hmm. uh, which statistically is the same as uncolored, but mm -hmm. it, is, it did actually indicate a rise in the number of cases. Um, this past Wednesday, we moved to yellow mm -hmm. um, with 13 cases over those 14 days. And uh, so my first question, which I, I will ask you, but what does it mean um, to you as a superintendent, not to uh, uh, the health department, we'll ask that when we talk to them, uh, that we are now yellow. And uh, on Monday alone, the town had eight additional cases, eight additional COVID-19 uh, cases. And it wouldn't be hard to imagine that when we look at next Wednesday's report, we could find that over the past 14 days, we've had 26 cases. Mm -hmm. And I, by my rough calculation, that would put us into the red zone. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, um, as a superintendent, not to the Board of Health or the Health Department, is what does it mean to you if our town is yellow or red, and uh, if you could uh, help us uh, navigate what you would do with that information? Sure. So I asked that question to the other superintendents today um, and of the Middlesex League superintendents in relation to um, sports, especially if playing a red <coughs> team, a, a team from a red town. So several of the um, uh, local towns are in the red um, and have been. Uh, so I'll tell you what I thought about this system from the outset. It, it seems on the surface to be pretty clear. If you're red, you should be really concerned. If you're yellow, it's a little bit, bit be a little bit alarmed. And if you're green or gray, then you're fine. But all it takes is one or two more cases, and it's not really statistically significant to move you from one zone to the next. It's not only how many cases you have, it's an increase in the positivity rate as well over time. So what the um, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has said about this is, you need to look at least, at least three different weeks reports that you have to stay red for at least three weeks before you really need to be concerned. That popping into the red for one, two, essentially everyone represents a two week period. So if you look at three weeks reports, they come out on Wednesdays in the evening. And I look at them and I share them every week on Facebook and Twitter. And if you don't follow me on either, you just go to the front page of our website. They, there's a scrolling um, display that has that on there as well. So what it says to me is, we need to ask hard questions. And I love that the data that is posted on the Winchester website differentiates between school cases and mm -hmm. resident cases. I, I would point out that the school cases include staff members who may not live in town. So if someone's trying to add all the numbers up, they may say, why are there more or fewer cases in the schools than are showing up on the residents? And it's because we only learn about people who don't live in Winchester who have a positive case when they tell us who, are, who work for us. Um, and that, but then they're included in our data on the chart that, has, that is labeled by school. And doesn't, that also doesn't include remote students. And it does not include remote students because there might be positive students who are fully remote and they wouldn't necessarily tell us that they had tested positive because they're not in school and it's not really our business to know unless they need additional time to do, you know, if they get ill, for example, and they can't attend class and they're absent. So, um, so what does it tell me as superintendent that we're now in the yellow and we're likely to move into the red? I think if you look, somebody did, um, a, a school committee member in Worcester did a, a graphic that shows sort of the progression over the past few weeks and months across the state. And what you can clearly see is there's a rise in cases. Mm -hmm. As more people are in towns, more people are interacting, more people are indoors. And I think there's a fatigue factor that more people are letting their guard down. Um, for example, uh, in the, in the hospital-based transmission, um, the procedures had been- Could you pull the microphone closer? Sure. In the hospital-based transmission, the 
transmission from staff members to patients and, and vice versa had been very low. But in the cases that they found that it happened, it's happening in break rooms where people are taking off their masks, <coughs> eating lunch, sitting close to mm. um, peers, and then putting their masks on and going and taking care of patients. And so um, people are um, uh, transmitting when they're letting their guard down, when they're eating at a restaurant with, a, with friends, when they're going to a friend's home. Uh, and, and we saw it with our you know, leaders uh, at the White House where there was a lot of transmission from a, allegedly a single event, a super spreader event. And so what I would say is a lot of towns around us are seeing increased cases. They're seeing family spread. In other words, parents spreading it to younger children or college age students spreading it to younger children. But we're not seeing child to child spread in a classroom. And as um, Ms. Marchand said, we are being so strict in the schools. You heard the students say, you're too strict. I can't talk to my friends and I have to wear my mask all the time. This is true. We've got you know, marks on the hallway where you have to walk. We have restrictions on how many kids can be in the bathroom at the same time. Every aspect of their life from the time they step onto the property is tightly controlled to avoid spread. And it is exhausting for all of us and exhausting for the kids to some extent, although they seem pretty happy in general. Um, so if I see us move into the red, it's going to be a little bit of a concern that there's a lot of community spread. And the other c question I would ask is, is it spread in a single institution like uh, an assisted living um, home or a nursing home or something like that? I don't believe that's the case. I think it's all individual families. But you have to remember that if someone has a large extended family and they, they all have a positive test, you could see the numbers jump by you know, 10, 12, 20 pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have children in the schools or the children are already quarantined, then there's no risk to our existing students. So being in the red doesn't necessarily mean we'll close classrooms. What's going to close classrooms is if there are close contacts in the school, if there is spread within the school, and if particularly teachers or support staff members have to quarantine and I don't have sufficient staff to keep the school open, that's what's going to close the schools or if the governor shuts us down. And I would hope that, just like happened last March, that if a lot of, a lot of uh, community spread is starting to happen very rapidly, that we send a signal and we shut it down, and that people hunker down and make really hard choices like don't go to your grandparents for Thanksgiving. And, and, and protect people who need to be protected, as we heard people speak tonight, who are on full remote because they have medical fragility and, and they could be, um, if exposed, it could be a real problem for them or their children. We've all had to make sacrifices. And I think I hear from many parents who are very angry because they have made tremendous sacrifices and they look around town and they see people not sacrificing. And then that makes it very, very difficult for them. And so. Um, I look at the numbers every single day. I think if we're in the red for several weeks and we really need to talk to the Board of Health and to the public health personnel, because I don't have access to the information to know whether it's family spread or it's other community spread. If it's school spread, then I know. But other than that, I don't. And I don't know whether there are children who are full remote, who are in pods, who are spreading, um, for example. And, uh, and so the, I am concerned about it. I watch it very closely. Um, but I think we can't be unduly concerned about a statistical shift from one. It's arbitrary, right? They set, the, they set you know, how many cases per 100,000 is, is going to trigger red as kind of an arbitrary number. And not all cases are created equal. So I hope that helps. That, that does very much so. Thank you very much. And I uh, mm. apologize for my lengthy question. I appreciate your lengthy answer. Sure. Can I just follow up with one question, Brian? Yes, because Lexington High School just had to close because they had unfor an unfortunate student event over mm -hmm. the weekend. Mm -hmm. And they've had to go full remote for the next couple weeks because of a student party. So I would also argue that as we go into the yellow and the red, knowledge of events such as that may make it more likely that we may have to shut down for public health's inability to adequately and quickly trace the individuals and the bubbles and the personal contacts that students or community members might have. And it also makes it riskier for our community to have students that have been at a large unmasked party, either indoors or outdoors, 
um, participate in. No, I 100% agree with you. And I think it's important to note that we've had no cases at the high school for quite some time. That could just be luck, um, right? Knock on wood. Um, but that I have more concerns about the younger children engaging because their parents are not protecting them than I do that our high school students making bad choices. Our sports teams are unbelievably successful this fall. Our students who are participating in sports, I am so grateful. I can't watch them because they can only have 50 spectators. Right. And I want their parents to get take the 50 slots. Mm -hmm. But what I can say to you is, from all accounts, they're doing everything that they should be doing when they're on the playing fields. Um, and um, I'm so grateful that those seniors get to have that chance because you know they missed out on the spring sports last year um, uh, and graduation last year and so many so many other memorable events. If we have to stop sports because people are not making good choices, if people mask and keep social distance, we can stop the spread. But if people in town make the bad, make bad choices, if our high school students make bad choices and we can't play sports, that's going to break the hearts of a lot of students. And Absolutely. So, um, I really don't want to see that happening. Thank you, Ms. Bergstrom. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, is it okay? Are we ready to move on to the next agenda topic? Seeing no additional questions, the next item on our uh, reports and discussion is the October 1st, 2020 enrollment report. Uh, Dr. Evans, you've shared with us um, two charts, I believe, in our packet. Mm -hmm. I'll kick it over to you. Sure. So there were some questions about um, some parents making choices to um, transfer to a private school for this year um, and or homeschool. And I fully respect that as a decision. I think that if parents feel um, that that's the best option for their family, we'll welcome them back when and if they choose to return. Um, in general, we've seen a decreased number of families choosing private school options, particularly for high school students, um, and very few choosing <coughs> vocational school options for high school students. What we did see this year was an unexpected number of students um, choosing to um, go to private schools from uh, primarily from the elementary level, but it's not a large number. Um, when you think about the total population of 2,000 elementary students. So there were 73 students who transferred to private schools from the, from the 2,000 elementary school students, and um, 36 of those were kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So almost half were kindergarten students. So there is a perception in some elementary schools that large numbers of families have left the district. They have not. But I respect that choice, and if that's the best choice for them, uh, private parochial schools don't have to follow the same rules we do in terms of special education or full inclusion. Um, they don't have teachers unions. Uh, they have fewer restrictions and they can come, they can make their own decisions about um, how much they're gonna charge for tuition and how, many, how much they're going to have for resources and how many students they're gonna have in a classroom. They don't have to follow the same rules we do. Um, and if that's the best choice, then parents should choose that option. But in general, fewer than 10 at a grade level have left the district for private schools beginning uh, in the, at the beginning of the summer. This was from, from the summer till the start of school. If a few more have left since then, I, I don't have that figure. Um, similarly, there's an increase in homeschool, but not a lot. 13 elementary students homeschooled. Um, and at McCall, um, we've got uh, let's see, six, six homeschool, six homeschool, high school three. So small number of homeschool. At McCall, we had 26 go to private schools and 24 at the high school. So again, not large numbers, more than we usually have. The biggest concern that I have is not only the kindergartners who withdrew who went to private school, but the kindergarten students who never enrolled at all or are just staying home for the year. Um, and what we really do for October enrollment is use it as our basis for enrollment projections for the following year. So in total, we've got about 123 um, students in private school district-wide and 22 homeschooled who might not otherwise have made that choice. So I would expect that if we're back fully in person for next fall, which I fully expect to be um, and plan to be, uh, that will have most of those 150 students back in the district. Um, and they're pretty spread out over um, 
all of our elementary schools, I've given you a chart that's got the numbers for all of the elementary schools. So uh, 18 Ambrose, 14 Lincoln, 11 Lynch, 11 Morocco, 19 Vio. So you can see it's pretty consistent numbers. And some parents are choosing to do that for educational reasons, and some are doing it for childcare reasons. Um, and, um, and so that's that information. Overall, then, um, we're seeing the same trend that we're seeing uh, statewide and nationally that we're, all districts across the state have seen a re dramatic reduction in kindergarten. We also are seeing a reduction in preschool, not because there's a reduced demand, but because we're keeping one cohort of students as opposed to mixing students. So we probably have about 40 fewer 30 to 40 fewer preschool students than we would typically have. We only have 239 kindergarten students. I had projected about 330. Um, and so you can see where the missing ones have, have, have not come to us. We're about 75 students short on kindergarten. Uh, you can see also grade one is a little bit below projection, but overall there are some grades where we're right at projection or slightly above. So even with the loss of, say, 10 students per grade to private schools, we still um, are uh, at or above projection in most cases if you take into account those private school and homeschooled students who've left us. Um, the, we're particularly full at middle school um, and uh, at the high school level, we're <coughs> holding steady. Um, we're about where we thought we would be. Maybe we're about 20 students fewer than, than Dennis Mahoney thought he'd have this fall. So overall, enrollment's very strong district-wide. Um, our overall numbers will be skewed by the kindergarten numbers and the slight reduction in first grade. But I fully expect those students back. And when they, when they come back, they'll stay with us for all 12 years, generally. Um, and so we need to, to build that into our baseline projection <coughs> when we look for um, our building project at Lynch or when we ask for uh, mm -hmm. teachers for next year as well. Right. Our budget for next year is going to be challenging, mm -hmm. both in terms of personnel and space needs. And if we have to add and an additional... Budget needs? <laughs> yeah. With Chapter 70 In Chapter 70. That. So they're <laughs> going to adjust Chapter 70 because they, they recognize that the, they'll use an average of enrollment for a couple of years, I think, because they recognize that this year's enrollment is not typical here or anywhere. Ours is much more robust than many districts, truthfully. Um, but what I would say is we typically run 110 sections of elementary. I think we'll probably need 115 next year. And that's you know a quarter of a million dollars in additional staffing. So right off the bat, we're probably going to need to run additional kindergartens and additional um, first grades. and. I don't have five classrooms. And so one of the things that Mr. Nixon brought up earlier is what's the plan for Parkhurst? And so, you know, sometime in the next couple of months, I'm going to be putting together a proposal to, that will likely re require us to open additional classrooms at Lynch and VO by moving preschool classrooms. It doesn't mean all the classrooms are gonna be in the right place um, because Lincoln is, is also very full. Um, and so, depending on enrollment patterns, um, we'll be in trouble for elementary classrooms um, mm -hmm. and may need to be creative. So that's why I have not put forward a plan about how we're going to use Parkhurst, because we may need to have a couple of swing kindergartens as well. Um, and so I'll, uh, as I get closer, and as I do a survey of the families who did not come to us this year, if I can identify who they are, we might get more information about whether they're coming back and whether they'll come back as kindergarten or first grade. That makes a big difference. So to, this is this is an unusual year and makes it very difficult to project. So to be clear, the 75 that were down in kindergarten, did they never enroll with us or did they unenroll? Uh, if you look on the page that shows private school um, movement. Right, there's only... There are 41 withdrawals. 41 withdrawals, so right? A little more than half of Right. So half of them are withdrawals and half are students who never enrolled. Okay. Because uh, you might remember it was March and we hadn't right. finished enrollment right. registration. That's what I was trying to figure yeah. out if it was. Yep. So happy to answer any okay. questions about enrollment in general. This is not the enrollment projection, but I'm just giving you a preview of coming attractions to uh, 
to give you a heads up that it's going to have a significant budget impact if we have a bounce back effect of all of the kindergartners who we are expecting next year plus the ones who didn't come this year. Thank you, Dr. Evans. I was just going to point out before we went to questions that I spent, uh, naturally spent some time crunching these numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and I compared them to our projections for this year because we had done projections. We are actually 99 student, 99 kindergarten students below our projection. Mm -hmm. From, for grades one through five, we are about 50 students below our projection. Six to eight were dead on, and nine to 12 were about 20 students mm -hmm. below our projection. Mm -hmm. So the, the bulk uh, below our projection, our projection was to increase a little bit too, so we're um, not nearly as far below what we were last year, but the bulk below our projection is 100 kindergarten mm -hmm. students who either never, never showed up or chose to go to private school. So um, I, I, I spent a lot of time sort of crunching numbers yeah. in all different ways, <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out. So. Questions or comments from the committee? The next time you provide us an enrollment report, Dr. Evans, could you also, on the sheet that has the private and homeschool, indicate how many students at each of those grade levels are remote so that as we're planning for a return to school, if any kind of return to school happens in a mid-year, we can no, we can have an idea in our heads of how many students we might be accounting for might need to come back into classrooms at those buildings. Does that make sense? So you'd like to know how many students at each school are remote? And at each grade level. And so third, if you would just add third, all third. remote, private, and hybrid yep. Yep. for each of those on, on this sheet. So those would be the, so these are the students who are no longer yeah. with us, so I True. probably would want to do a separate report for a remote that, and hybrid. That works too. Yeah, I just, I, 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 sometimes I, think, I like seeing them all side by I side. But <laughs> what, uh, uh, my apologies, I'm not trying to interrupt. I think the idea okay. was to see what students could potentially come back, say mid-year we could go back to full in-person. Right. Um, somebody who's remote could come back to full in-person. Someone who's homeschooling could come back to homeschool. And somebody who went to a private could say, hey, mm -hmm. I'm right. going to go Correct. back to full. In and all of those, every, each and every one of them would have the option to do that if, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if that yep. were uh, right. able. Right, we're a public school district. Yeah. We take everybody who's eligible. So therefore, I think, right. I, is that where that was your? Correct. OK. OK. Yeah, we'll see. See what I can do. I think I can clean this up and make it a little more useful. Additional questions? Or I just want to make sure we're not losing track of that and losing track of kids because um, with all the conversation this evening of going back to full in-person, particularly at elementary, that, that could really change our staffing and our positions. And so I think we need to just keep track of it. Additional questions or comments from the committee? I had one, if I could. Mr. Nixon, yes. So, uh, as it's just dawned on me here in our, our late sort of conversation, I think it was at our last school committee meeting, we were having a conversation with Ms. Gerard about our LBLD program in CO. And you will recall, I was surprised that we had dropped one of the uh, sessions based on the age credit of students. Um, at one point, I think we had three different sections of the LBLD program, um, just given the age spread. And so a question that I, I have, and I don't really expect an answer from Dr. Evans right now, but it, it is a concern of mine. In the context of needing more classrooms for more students, can we get some sort of gut check, either from Dr. Evans or from Ms. Gerard, about what we will need to continue to support our four specialized learning centers at all of our elementary schools except Lincoln, which just doesn't have one because it has no space. I thought I heard from Ms. Gerard at the last meeting that we will need a, we will likely need an additional space, an instructional space for an expanded LBLD program in BO. I think I heard that. So I, I'd like to understand if that's the case, but, but also looking at the Spectrum program, the partnership program and so forth, if that, those are frankly some of our most vulnerable Students. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to be sure we're looking at the whole picture in terms of understanding what the space needs are and, and whether or not that also might be a consideration for Dr. Evans in terms of how partners may be used. No, absolutely. Um, the, uh, as, you, as you acknowledge, uh, s students need to be separated by age level even if they're in the same program. Um, and, um, and planning for next year will, will include that 
projection projection for how many classrooms we'll need, not only for the language-based program, but for, um, we have long said that we likely need to expand our preschool, um, medically fragile or intensive population um, uh, provisions, and so might need to add an additional preschool for that. Mm -hmm. Not a large number of students, but a program. Um, so I'll, I'll circle back. Right now, our language-based program really starts in grade three. There's some indication that it might be useful for some grade two students. Um, I don't know who those students are. We're, we're fast and furiously catching up on evaluations, and um, so we'll have more data. There's lots of testing going on for students with disabilities. Um, to be sure that our programs match their needs and that we plan for next year. So um, that will factor into the use of Parkhurst for sure. Um, and whatever plan we put forward, uh, you know, I think once Lynch is completed in a few years, it'll help us um, bounce back. But I still remain very concerned about building projects going on in town, additional um, apartments or condos, mm -hmm. residential housing units, um, and we still continue to have registrations every week. And so we'll, we have probably more students now than we did on October 1st. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll continue to do that throughout the year as um, some of the housing units are finished. Um, and uh, particularly next school year when some of the larger ones will be finished. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Any additional questions or comments on this topic? Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Nixon, did you have a question? You, I saw you on mute. Well, I, I, I was just going add, to add to Dr. Evans' comment. We, we just sent a memo into the MSBA for the Lynch Project that seeks to try to quantify uh, our latest understanding on building projects, which is just what the superintendent was speaking towards. Um, we've done another update on what we think that impact is going to mean in terms of elementary students, not just at Lynch, but district-wide. And uh, it's, it's three figures. <laughs> So uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Evans, we could we could put that memo in the packet because I think in our yep. the future agenda item we have a Lynch update. We okay. could share that information and you could talk more at that time about sort of the scope of impact of building projects in Winchester. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. And that was a great memo. It did summarize the, the, the three-figure number of additional students we might imagine um, by the time uh, a new Lynch would open. So uh, certainly, uh, as we talk about enrollment, a concerning number. So seeing no additional questions or comments, I'd like to thank you, first mm -hmm. of all, and move on to the next agenda item, which is preparation for the November 5th town meeting. Uh, uh, I sent out a memo today. I'm sorry it came out a little bit late. Um, although I, in my own defense, in my three years on school committee, I've actually never actually, we haven't had a discussion about what we're gonna talk about at town meeting, but I thought it was a good thing to do because we're in a COVID year. I felt like it was important that we're all on the same page about what's being discussed. Uh, I see a typo in the memo immediately. It was the town clerk invited all committees to prepare a pre-recorded, not the town manager, five minute presentation. So we will have an opportunity to record at WinCam a five minute presentation. Currently our slot, which is the last slot that was offered by the town clerk uh, on behalf of WinCam, is this Thursday at 5 p.m. I do not believe that we will have our presentation ready to go. And I also believe it would be a little bit, shall I say, reckless to prepare a presentation uh, 10 days before town meeting that said um, anything um, committal about the state of the schools 10 days before it was gonna be given. Um, however, uh, we will work on doing that, and if we have to record it outside of WinCam, I, uh, WinCam has been extraordinarily uh, generous of their time, and I'm, I, I have no doubt that if we need to record it later, that they will help us with that, um, that plan. Uh, so five minutes. Um, the plan was for the vice chair and the chair to record this at WinCam, much like we did in the spring, although in the spring that was, I think, a 12 or 13 minute presentation in the end. Um, uh, I've given you an outline of some of the slides that I anticipate, an introduction, some of the changes. That, uh, we have to remember that while we are all intimately aware with what's happening in the schools, and so are many parents, many town meeting members are, are no longer parents of uh, students in our district, so they will want to understand a little bit about the hybrid and remote changes due to the um, global pandemic, changes in athletics and activities, and 
We also, I think it's fair that we discuss changes and planned implementation to our logo and anti-racism training is taking place right now because we have to be well aware that we don't have just one pandemic. We have two pandemics taking place right now. So I want to be clear that we want to talk about all of those. Slide three, I'm imagining, will be a list of some of the things that we've been talking about tonight, some of our financial knowns and unknowns for this year and next. This, I imagine, will be a very high-level slide um, so that when Springtown meeting comes around, we have given um, some notice as far as what we know and what we don't know now. Uh, Slide four, an enrollment snapshot for 2020, much like what we just talked about. I think slide four will be very similar to the discussion we just had. Uh, slide five, I think then addresses the return of the students who will be coming either through uh, returning from uh, uh, our kindergarten students, for example, or from out of, uh, not, excuse me, private school. Um, so we would talk about the Morocco School Life Extension Program, which is um, capital uh, initiative uh, per se, but also something we discussed earlier tonight. The Lynch MSBA update and the McCall edition, which is now complete. And I think it will be important to thank town meeting and show them mm -hmm. um, that. And then I would end with a conclusion slide. We would end with a conclusion slide. Trying to squeeze that all into five minutes will be <laughs> a Herculean task. Um, talk but fast. I, yes, talk fast. Talk fast. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I open it up to um, direction that the committee would like to go in as far as if this is a good direction to go in, keeping in mind the constraints we have, um, we, um, such as we can't add 10 more slides. But if there's additional topics that they think are important that are included, it's a memo, it shouldn't be in your packet, I, it was emailed out, so you should have it under separate cover. So I would be uh, happy to respond to any questions or comments. and. Uh, and I, I do have a draft, which I'm not sharing with you, uh, but it's not going to have a lot of words. It's largely going to be pictures, and the words are going to be spoken. Right. So. It's an ambitious five minutes. May I, may I weigh in, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Nixon. So I, uh, very quick thought, because um, I'm pulling up to my second hockey ring. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it, uh, although I always, I, and I'm fond of ending on a positive note. I think I think a message that would be especially important for the chair to communicate this year is is what we do not know. And because you're you're speaking to town meeting, and I, I'm talking to uh, you about just I think um, the important thing I made earlier tonight. Um, we developed a budget in December and January that never contemplated a global pandemic. The budget that we got was less than the budget we initially voted and said we needed. And uh, we are, so, so we're working with a budget that wasn't developed for the situation we find ourselves in. And we are spending money on things, therefore, we never contemplated. Um, and we've got a lot of important work ahead, I think, frankly, at the beginning of our very next school committee meeting, where perhaps we look at various different assumptions and start encumbering funds to see how long it lasts us. Um, I, can, I think the last time we ever had to ask for supplemental funding was about 14, 15 years ago, um, that's a big deal. And I don't want town meeting, um, as unpleasant as that prospect might be, and I'm not saying we will need to do it, but perhaps we might. Um, as unpleasant as that prospect might be, it will be all the more unpleasant if it comes as a surprise. So uh, I think you're, uh, you're in a difficult spot, but I do think you should be really candid with town meeting in terms of what we understand and what we just don't know yet with respect to our budget and, uh, frankly, our burn rate. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. I think that's um, uh, unfortunate but outstanding advice because uh, I agree I would like to the presentation to be able to end on a high note. And I think it still can. I think at the same time we need to be honest in the presentation about our unknowns. Um, for this year and moving forward, both as far as finances and enrollment. So I think that's a good point. Um, Brian, will you also cover um, what the budget, since our, they did, since town meeting also did generously um, increase our budget over what FinCom had recommended? Are you, will you also be sharing what we were able to add this year as part of our? Um, I, We'll have to think about that again with the constraints we right, have. Right, I know. Um, but 
but I, I think I, I people don't... might be curious of where the additional, how the additional funding was used, and that it's not just PPE. I will. It sounds like I'm non-committal, but I'll take that under advisement and see if I can uh, make squeeze it, it in. <laughs> squeeze it in, because I think that is a, a good, uh, I mean, one of the things that Mr. Nixon alluded to is that we haven't had this full discussion on our finances Correct. for this year because we're in a global pandemic year right. and there are other priorities that, that have been coming, I will say, in the way. Right. And so, Without having that full discussion, I hesitate to present to town meeting something that we as a committee have not fully vetted. So I prefer to, so as far as things that we've already spent it on and right. unknown, that's something I can do. As far as where we're going, that's the harder part. So, no, I'm so, thinking of the, the staff that we yeah. were able to add and, yes, and the things that we were able to do and this I year was, and, and that there, because some of those staff members I think have been incredibly valuable because of the hybrid and remote models. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's always nice to thank town meeting for what they were able to offer us as well. That is a excellent point. Thank you. Any additional questions? Good luck to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, will, we will need it. And uh, a reminder that town meeting is on November, November 5th. 5th. And uh, actually, before we uh, conclude this agenda item, uh, planning for fall town meeting, town meeting will be held remote. It will be here as it was for spring town meeting. And we need to decide whether there's a need to have the school committee and the superintendent in person here, or whether given the uh, uh, issues on the docket this year, whether we need, don't need to be here in person. So I, I'm, uh, I'm inclined to say that the fewer people we have here, the better, uh, so that we don't if become a super spreader event here. And there is nothing on the agenda, on the uh, warrant, that would seem to warrant having one or more of us here. But I'm open to other thoughts. I believe in June we found it valuable to have the people here who may be needed to respond to questions or presentation, but that the additional <coughs> members need not be present. And as you point out, there are so many members of town meeting that do need to be available without techni technical glitches of yeah. remote participation. So I, I would fully support that you would need to be present and whoever else would be presenting, but beyond that. So uh, to, to, that, to that remark, I don't believe any of us will be presenting at town meeting this year. But this you may not need to be available for questions. True, although Article 1 has no questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to decide whether right. whether we need to be here or not. If it's a consent agenda for a uh, majority of the items and there are no school committee items on the warrant other than Article 1, and Article 1 takes no questions and might not yep. even be presented. So I just... Uh, can I, I make, can I make a suggestion? Absolutely. So much like the town manager um, participated remotely in the spring town meeting, mm -hmm. um, I think that if we, uh, if you make a request to the moderator um, or the town clerk to be placed on a list of panelists, that could, could you could be promoted to panelist if there mm -hmm. were questions that came from town meeting members, or if I could be promoted to panelist, certainly I'll attend both meetings virtually and make myself available if. Um, people had questions about the school department in any in any forum, um, but that remote participation. You could answer questions as easily mm -hmm. remotely as you could um, sitting here. Mm -hmm. And there's not because they use this room that we're sitting in now. There's not a lot of other spaces here for us mm -hmm. to socially distance, um, and so it makes it a little more difficult if we're all physically here present. Mm -hmm. But certainly we could ask to be acknowledged as panelists if there were questions. I think Lesson I would also check with pandemic. Mr. Haley and yeah. see what. He, how strongly he feels about having the superintendent or the chair of the school committee present in person as well. And, and I agree, I will reach out to him. I'm happy to be here, but only if it serves a purpose. Exactly. It serves, mm -hmm. yep. has value. Um, so seeing no additional questions or comments, uh, 
We'll move on to the agenda. The next item in the agenda is to vote, is an action item, uh, vote to approve the MASC resolution on MCAS and high stakes testing. At our workshop last week, we discussed this um, uh, resolution put forward by the MASC. I'd like to, before I pass it over to superintendent, um, I would like to point out that uh, we discussed at last meeting that there might be wordsmithing that people might want to do, so I will um, obviously I'll, um, open that to anybody who would like to wordsmith any part of this. Uh, I didn't see any um, uh, need to do it at the last meeting. But I also want to point out to uh, everybody who's at home that the resolution is not about the district deciding whether to hold MCAS this year or not hold MCAS this year. And it's not about whether the district should decide to waive any graduation requirements set out by the state. This is a resolution um, calling for the state to, uh, in fact, I will read it and then I'll pass it over. My apologies. Or just screen share. I, I can't screen share on this okay. thing. Okay. Um, uh, I can screen share at home. I actually have better yeah. access to technology at home. Um, I, I don't actually need to read it. We can read it um, when we go to vote it, um, if we go to vote it. Uh, I just want to be clear that it's not about whether or not we are rejecting MCAS this year, and I think that some of the public comment uh, may have misunderstood what this resolution was. So, Dr. Evans, do you have anything you'd like to add about this uh, resolution? Um, no, I think the, the resolution came from the S State um, Association of School Committees. I think there are many districts um, uh, voting on a similar resolution with maybe some slight wording changes, as you said, wordsmithing it. Um, the, uh, as superintendent, it's easier for me to speak more directly about this. Um, you know, as, as the chair points out, it's not really our decision to participate or not um, unless school committee decides to do that. This is really about encouraging the state not to implement the MCAS this year. Not only does it cost millions of dollars to implement the MCAS, that could be money that could be used for other better purposes. Um, it also um, it sets districts up to uh, use a lot of um, time that could be used for learning uh, to complete a standardized test. Our students do extraordinarily well on the MCAS site. I think, and I would expect that they would again this year, but that's not um, a useful uh, um, measurement tool for us in general. Um, and because the state is going to require students to be physically present in a school to take the MCAS, it's going to be very difficult for us. We have students physically present in our school. Um, we could not welcome back the 20% of the students who are full remote easily. Um, and it could take several weeks of the two, per, two days a week uh, that students are there to do the MCAS. Um, and it just seems to me um, a, not a wise Sorry. use Sorry. of resources and not a wise um, uh, decision on the part of the D DESE. They're just doing it for compliance reasons, and it seems to me not the best route to go. That's my opinion as superintendent. School committee members have not weighed in on that aspect of it, um, whether or not we take more uh, direct action to participate or not participate is something we should decide as a school committee, but right now it's just a resolution to encourage the legislature and the DESE to reverse their course and to do the same thing they did last year, which was defer the MCAS. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, do, I think we had it shared there for a second and okay. maybe... <laughs> Back um, to them. But to be clear, Dr. Evans, do, last year as, um, as we see on the DESE website, they didn't, um, they didn't get rid of a competency determination for students to graduate, though. They just allowed you to use appropriate high school courses instead of a standardized test to determine competency. Isn't that correct for the last year's graduating seniors? They did, but all of our okay. students easily had already you know, met the competency requirements. Right. Yeah, except but for students with very significant It's not like there was zero accountability, is I no, guess what I I'm mean, saying. I, I think we have pretty stringent graduation requirements. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said, most of the you, you heard from the seniors tonight, they're not worried. They've all passed the MCAS um, for the most part, um, and as sophomores. 
Uh, and so it, this is not an issue, you know, it, it, for di it's easy for a district like Winchester to say the MCAS doesn't mean a lot to us because most of our students far surpass the MCAS in terms of their content and skills knowledge um, and are able easily to be um, proficient or advanced on the MCAS um, and score in the top, you know, 1% in the state for the most part. Um, so it's not a good measurement tool for us and it's not a good use of the very limited instructional time that we have. And it's going to require an immense effort uh, to coordinate it and supervise it. And um, I'm just very concerned that that's not a good use of resources. So that's why I'm, I'm suggesting strongly that we uh, move in this direction. Um, but yeah, there, there are certainly many accountability measures that our students have, have met or surpassed for high school graduation. So, uh, um, Ms. Marshall? I just wanted to follow up because Chris asked if I could reach out to our legislators. Yes. Um, I did speak with Senator Lewis's office, and they shared some concerns that the current federal administration is not likely to grant waivers. Also, the Baker administration, our governor, may not even apply for the waiver, even if the federal administration mm -hmm. changes. Um, Senators Lewis and Jalen are w still working to build support for MCIEA. That's the mm -hmm. consortium we belong to that does um, project-based assessments. Performance. Performance-based. I always confuse them. Mm -hmm. Performance-based assessments. Um, and they are meeting with the MTA, the Massachusetts Teachers Association, in the near future to discuss MCIEA. So there's some positive work happening at, in our legislate, legislative representatives. We have to continue to educate not only our um, governor and our legislators, because most of the legislators, especially in the House, aren't really, uh, still support the idea of MCAS. So we have a lot of education to do in terms of our representatives and the public, as we heard today, on why high stakes testing doesn't work not only for our children, our students who are higher achieving, but especially for uh, underserved communities and how it creates equity issues. Um, and so this is just one more way for us to continue advocating for a better system for um, accountability measures. So that's why I will uh, hope that we vote to support it. Thank you, Ms. Marchant. Uh, are there questions or comments from the committee? Um, uh, and, uh, yes, Mr. Nixon, I was just going to say, are questions or comments from the committee? We can um, move forward one of two ways. We can uh, accept a motion and then discuss, but I'm happy to discuss first and then do a motion afterwards. That might be the cleanest way for tonight. So, yes, Mr. Nixon. So, so I, I appreciate Ms. Marchant was actually able to speak with the folks. I had, I had sent out an email prior to our last school committee meeting uh, wasn't sure if I get any response back, um, and I did. But although I did, it, it's not really in conflict with anything that Marshawn heard. Although I, I, the message was clear that uh, both in the House and in the Senate, um, it is unlikely for the bills that have been filed to move forward. Um, that is to, you know, postpone or, or waive and cap um, for the year. Um, there is concern about that 700 or 770 million dollars in federal funding to Massachusetts to make it tied up. Um, but I heard from the legislative liaison that it, although bills were filed, they're not likely to move forward. The, the, however, it was also made clear that um, the reason why those may be stalling is that there is a feeling on Beacon Hill that there was a lot of good conversation and understanding last spring in and among legislative representatives, MTA, governor's office, DESE, um, and that those conversations are going on like today. Um, so I, I don't feel like I don't feel like this issue is not being attended to on Beacon Hill or in Destiny, if you will. And I wondered if you could clarify, Mr. Chair. I know you said that the resolution doesn't do, does not speak to gift cap testing across the district. But my memory was the draft we saw at the last meeting did include a paragraph below the declaration itself. It spoke to impact testing at other grade levels. Is my memory not correct? No, so your memory is correct. Uh, but again, uh, what I, I, I meant to say, and perhaps I failed, was that the resolution is not our district saying we're not going to perform MCAS testing this year. The resolution 
Um, the second paragraph that you're referring to says, additionally, we stand with the Mass Association of School Committees, call for a moratorium of all MCAS testing for the 2020-2021 school year so that students can focus on direct instruction rather than losing additional time to testing. So what I meant to say, and I probably was unclear, was that this resolution does not say that Winchester is opting out. Unilaterally. Unilaterally. It's, again, recommend calling for this to take place. Uh, is that clear? For the clarification. It is. I, so I have some of the thoughts on this, but I'll, I'll wait until if you wanted to take a motion and have other conversation. And I was, I was eager to know if members had wordsmithed this, um, if there were alternative versions to consider. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Any questions, comments, or a desire to put a motion forward? Um. Ms. Bolognese. So I guess when I was reading through this resolution, um, I'm, I'd like to make sure that we stay focused on this year and that we're looking at the resolution that says we're um, asking that 10th graders be held harmless for not taking the MCAS or making up the MCAS and that their graduation, and that this is not playing into their graduation requirements. And also on the final paragraph about um, uh, calling for a moratorium on all MCAS testing for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, but I guess, I'd, I guess I would like to stay focused on that. Um, and also that we've, and I acknowledge fully that we've missed valuable face-to-face -face instructional opportunities. But um, I would, I guess I would suggest taking a step back from um, making a statement on c accountability of the Commonwealth um, over reliance on high stakes testing. Thank you, Ms. Bolognese. Dr. Evans, I have a question. I kind of dug into this and couldn't um, seem to find anything. Do you have any idea whether the MCAS testing that would be coming out this year would be adapted to the, um, the core standards that the state has asked us to cover? Or So some of the, the parents have um, raised the question of whether this would be a valuable thing for us to do to demonstrate learning loss. And I understand the length of time that takes to get it back wouldn't necessarily, but I'm wondering if we anticipate the state making any changes to the MCAS testing, because it's usually based on our standards. Yeah, Jen, could you take this question? Um, have you heard any uh, anything about adjusted MCAS to take into consideration the priority standards for the COVID time period? Um, so they're, you know, saying in some ways that they're adjusting in a sense because they're going back to write the legacy testing. Right. But, um, and they, but they just released, when I say just, I mean, I don't know, within the past couple of weeks is when they released the, you know, this year's prioritized standards. So um, I really don't know how they would be adjusting that because if they're testing in January and they just released the standards, I mean, when you think about how many days we have with students, um, I don't know how much of a quote unquote difference that can make um, before January's testing. So it's all been very, um, you know, and I'm not even pointing the finger at Desi around this piece because like us, they're doing the best they can to right. like, prioritize what's most important to get out to people. Um, and clearly their priority was less to focus on the standardized testing than it was to get schools open, as it, I believe it should be. Um, but clearly, when you're just releasing this year's standards, when it was already into October, um, you know, I don't even think they've been clear with the expectations for this year or given us the ability to really, quote unquote, prepare for it. So I'll get off of my soapbox. But no, I don't think it's been very clear or open the way that we know exactly what it will be like. And like I said last time, we're returning to a different kind of testing that our students haven't had because now they're returning to the legacy and they've been on the 
the new form of MCAS. So. so it may not even be comparable data for us, is I guess what I'm... Um, if it, it definitely won't be comparable data. So it's I not... Mean, in addition to which you're talking about the timing of years, so forget how much we time we've lost. We never do the kind of testing in January that we'd be doing in January. So um, it won't, it'll be apples to oranges, if that's your question. Sorry, I'm not being clear. No, it was both. You're, you're doing great. <laughs> it was both how much had Desi indicated that they would adjust it and if it was even a reliable year-to-year -year measure for us that, um, that we would even be able to see you know, student, student growth or student loss over time if it was a different test, different standards, different, different way of doing things. It's not like it's the same test the kids have even been seeing. Right, and I think what everyone needs to um, think about when they're considering that this is a way to measure some of the things that they may be hoping it'll measure, um, and this is a part that's normally highly publicized, so it's not that people would know this in general, mm -hmm. the way that the DESI reports out, but um, those are scale scores. Um, that we get, and the scaled scores are what put the students into the different categories, needs improvement, exceeds expectations, et cetera. Um, but behind the scenes, what's happening is those scaled scores are based on raw scores. And the raw scores literally can change every year and often do change, and certainly change dramatically over time. So um, I would suggest that those Scaled scores can be set to whatever threshold they decide is a raw score that is equivalent to meets expectations or exceeds expectations. Um, it basically often operates much like the old bell curve. So to Judy's point, our students will do well and they will continue to do well. There is no way that the state is going to turn testing into, you know, all of our students are suddenly in needs improvement or um, morning flash failing. Um, they'll just change what the raw score is that meets the certain thresholds to get to the scaled score of 220 or 230 or 240. Um, so those numbers don't mean the same thing every year. I think that's important that people know. Thank you. So I think it's, I think it's important um, to retain the first several paragraphs in this resolution. Because I think as a district for the last several years, we have been um, passionate about MCIEA and different ways of accountability for our students. And while this is a different year for our, our community, our country, in terms of why we um, might feel that um, we want to um, waive the MCAS graduation requirements for our 10th graders and um, for our students because of many reasons, loss of learning time, the fact that the data won't even produce things that are necessarily relevant and meaningful to us for making academic decisions for our kids. I think that much of the first several paragraphs also matches many of the things that we have been including in our school committee goals and our district goals for the last several years. And to Ms. Marchant's point, it provides an excellent opportunity to um, have conversations with our community and um, be able to describe better why it is we're doing what we're doing and how it is designed to produce better outcomes for students and outcomes that aren't biased based on um, students with learning disabilities, students of lower socioeconomic statuses, ELL students, minority students, and provide a level sort of assessment and playing field for everyone. So in that way, I feel like the first part of this resolution is actually quite valuable. Thank you, Ms. Bergstrom. Are so, there additional questions or comments, or do we want to have a motion of some sort? And if there's uh, motions to amend the motion, I'm happy to accept those as well. I would like to make a motion to approve the MASC resolution on MCAS and high stakes testing as discussed. I'll second that motion. Thank you. All right, is there any discussion any uh, among the committee before we go to a vote? Um. I guess I would Ms. own. Bowling, yes. Oh yes, sorry. <laughs> I guess that I would only comment um, that yes, I think it's important to have these discussions. Um, 
around MCAS, around MCIEA, um, and the data that we would like to get and the ways that we would like to assess our students. Um, and yes, we, in our district goals, we have stressed that we believe that social emotional health and performance-based testing, um, <coughs> performance assessments um, are our focal points for our district. Um, and I, I guess here, with the way that the first few paragraphs are stated, um, I don't know that we as a committee have previously and repeatedly expressed concern and doubt about the accountability system um, or about the accountability system. Um, so I guess I'm a little on the fence still about the first four paragraphs. So, but open to that conversation, totally. <laughs> so. Um, so if we have uh, previously and repeatedly, we are, is expressing concern now. Now, but not previously and repeatedly. Yes, so. I'm, I'm sorry to disagree, but yeah, we've done it numerous times at this. Can you speak up and pull the microphone closer sure. to you? Thank you. Um, we have actually many times at our figurative table um, discussed our concerns, um, especially as we move towards the social emotional learning and um, some of the other equity issues we had discussed previously. Um, I feel very strongly about that statement that we have done that repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Didn't we also, as a committee, also pass a resolution last spring similar to this, I believe? So we have previously expressed concern. We did so last spring. So Mr. Nixon, I saw you unmuted. I didn't know if you had a question or comment and then if you would like to go first. Uh, so um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. So we have some we have some audio challenges tonight. Those of you who are still in the studio, you're sort of very faint compared to those of us participating remotely. So I'm sort of adjusting the volume back and forth. So I, I wanted to just ask, can I, could Ms. Bergstrom repeat that last remark that she just made? Uh, about last spring? I said I believe whatever that... It was, whatever it was you said, it was just very hard to hear. <laughs> I said that um, I believe uh, we were discussing whether we have previously and repeatedly expressed concern um, about the accountability system. And I said that I believe last spring we passed a similar resolution <coughs> on MCAS. I could be <coughs> wrong um, when we uh, were addressing whether it should be waived last spring. So this is not the first time we've expressed concern about MCAS and whether it would meet our district and districts across the Commonwealth's needs in assessing students um, appropriately and equitably. Got it. So I, I, um, I guess as the great here uh, for most of the like, school committee member, uh, I, I wanted to offer that I, I share some discomfiture with uh, Ms. Bolognese in the, in the first couple of paragraphs of this because I feel like I feel like if we simply go back and look at the agenda and minutes of this committee, I don't think that you'll find a record of some of the statements that we're saying we've made in the resolution. And that's not to say that we haven't had some conversation about it, but I would remind the committee, you know, from time to time we talk about our meeting minutes and how detailed they should be how the green line they should be and really we talked at length and dr evans has reminded us about what really should or shouldn't be essential in meeting minutes so if something like this is so essential that we're going to vote on a resolution then i think you you'd expect to find these breadcrumbs in our meeting minutes and i would i would posit that you don't although there's no doubt we've had these discussions and so from my, here's my point of view, and I'm gonna make sort of, as the architect, I'm gonna make a building analogy. If, if the MCAS we have today, which really MCAS 2.0, if it's like a set of construction documents you've sent out to bid, you've got a contractor on board, you're ready to break ground, you're ready to go. And then the efforts of NCIEA are sort of 
from a different point of view, a different architect, a different design philosophy that's really interesting and really compelling and may really lead us, may lead you to a better design solution. But it's not fully baked. It's more conceptual in nature. It's not a set of construction drawings. You don't have a contractor or on board. Um, I think uh, my interest in the conversations we've had around, around what NCIA is all about and, and pursuing performance-based assessment is really very exciting and meaningful to me, and I'm appreciative of the time that Dr. Evans and Dr. Ellen Emma and some school committee members have, have put into it, and, and I'm really excited for the future. I'm excited about where that's going to take us. I truly am. But a concern that I have, if we do not administer, but two quick thoughts. Um, if we do not administer MCAS, to Dr. Evans' earlier point, you don't get the results right away. They typically come in the fall. So with no MCAS administration, we don't get the next round of test results until the fall of 22. So that's two years away. It is a fair question, which is, so what, what are we actually doing then in the interim? Not to say that NCAP 2.0 is perfect, it's not, it has its flaws, but I, I, I have some reluctance both about some of the wording at the front of the resolution, and then as I think more about, to the chair's point, about what the declaration really is about, which is our high school students, I wanted to, I wanted to make this case to the school committee that we, we, we typically talk about, in, we talk about standardized testing and we throw out the adjective high stakes. In my strong opinion, the only thing that makes the MCAS a high stakes test is the graduation requirement. So sitting for the MCAS is a different, it's a different issue than the graduation requirement. Um, it's a big deal to sit for an MCAS at every grade level. You've got to have the equipment for it. You've got to make the time for it. But I, I also feel like we, and I'm I'm, I'm going to use air quotes when I say we. We meaning the school committee, the administration, parents, and even students. Some students. I feel like we're sometimes talk out of both sides of our mouth because on the one hand, I feel like from time to time we put down the MCAS and say that it, it really isn't very meaningful. And yet when the MCAS results come out, we trumpet the results. And I am certain that in some households in Winchester, there are conversations around the dinner table about whether or not a child is ready for MCAS and what the kids' MCAS scores were. Uh, there is a kid in my own family who was with bated breath wanting to know what the MCAS results were and if they'd come in the mail yet. And that makes me sick to my stomach because we're too wrapped up in it. I have been in hockey locker rooms where young players have been you know, pinging each other, wanting to know what they got on the in-caps, trying to one-up one another. That's like, it, 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 it's almost disgusting. So we've made it into a bigger thing than it needs to be. I think the value of in -caps, and I appreciate the comment, and it might have been Ms. Marchand or Ms. Bergstrom was just talking about um, a, a more sort of unbiased way to find assessments, which is really important. Um, the SGP, the student growth percentage, is so important because it just simply speaks to, you know, what was that student's growth and learning year over year? And that's always been, I think, in, in certain years, that's been really what the district is focused on. And that's still very meaningful to me. And so in the absence of something else, um, I don't want to take any action tonight that, that suggests we are we're looking to put the MCAS out the pasture until I have a better sense of where the NCIEA is, where NCIEA is going to lead us. Um, I didn't say it earlier. Our, our legislative liaison from the Senate, in particular, spoke with enthusiasm about what NCIEA is doing. That's terrific. So they have a seat at the table, um, but they're not there yet. I, I'm. I'm uncomfortable that we, we we may do a good thing badly tonight. Um, and, and, and maybe the last thought I would just leave, by the way, I, I totally support eliminating it as a graduation requirement. Um, I'm glad the chair pointed out it's really about our high school students tonight. But I would remind this committee, I think we've all been in the case, we've all, we've all felt this way. We get an email or a phone call or sometimes it comes from public comment at a school committee meeting. When a parent 
takes clearly a great deal of time to put together a lengthy tome, um, a statement, uh, a declaration, spend a lot of time on it, and and there are some somewhere in it, let's say some fundamental misunderstandings. And I, I read these things and I think to myself, if only we had had a conversation and had more understanding. I asked at the last school committee meeting who this declaration would even be addressed to. And I think Ms. Marchand said, we might release it to the press. But my point was, who, who are we speaking to? Is it the commissioner? Is it the Board of Education? Is it Beacon Hill? It may be all of them, right? But I think the information that we got um, through the superintendent from Ms. Bergstrom about the decision last year was really helpful because it made clear that that was a board decision, a board of education decision. And therefore, in my mind, that's really kind of where the conversation should be taking place. So um, I almost feel like we're skipping a step. I, I wish I had more understanding about what's in the board's head with respect to MCAS. Um, but I, I'm not opposed to making a statement about holding our high school students harmless. I'm not opposed to withdrawing the graduation requirement. But I, I'm very uncomfortable about going beyond that without a broader understanding of what the opportunities are for testing and assessment of all the kids in our district. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Um, before we move to a vote, I would uh, like to express that I tend to agree with the vice chair that the focus of this resolution, in my mind, is the final three paragraphs. Whereas Winchester, students of Winchester have missed valuable face-to-face -face instructional opportunities with their lead teachers, would benefit from focusing on these important instructional opportunities and social-emotional supports in the limited time available to them. Resolved that seniors are, don't have it as a graduation requirement and that we don't spend the time on the MCAS. I'm not disagreeing with paragraphs one, two, three, and four, but in my, my personal opinion, I think they water down the intent of this resolution, which is focused on this year. So that's, just wanted to put that out there. Any questions or comments before we move to a vote? Well, then I, I would make an amendment okay. to the, 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 I believe it was moved Paragraph in the second column of the declaration as it was presented. So my, my, my motion to amend would be that we strike all but then the last three paragraphs that you just referred to, Mr. Chairman. That is. Okay. So I have a motion to amend the motion, uh, which would make our resolution to be the final three paragraphs um, as indicated that I just indicated there. Do I have a second to that motion? I was moving in that direction. I was about to say that. So yes, I second that. So that is moved and second. Is there any discussion about the motion to amend the original motion? I would argue that it's paragraph three also refers to the experiences of our kids this year, as does four. In fact, paragraph three says hybrid and remote models. So I will call a vote on the motion to amend the original motion. Uh, the uh, motion to amend would be to reduce the resolution to the final three paragraphs as indicated. Um, we require a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Nixon, how do you vote on the motion to amend the main motion? Aye. Ms. Bolognese? Aye. Ms. Bergstrom? I'll vote aye. Ms. Marchant? No. Chair votes aye. The motion uh, passes four to one, which returns us to the main motion, which is now a resolution um, with the of the final three paragraphs 
listed in the resolution. Any additional discussion? I'm the, sorry, could you say that again? The, what is on the table now is the main motion, which is a resolution starting with the first, second, third, fourth, fifth paragraph, whereas the students of Winchester have missed valuable face-to-face -face instructional opportunities with their teachers and would benefit from focusing on those important instructional opportunities and social emotional supports in the limited time available to them. Therefore, be it resolved, those, mm -hmm. I, okay. I could read it again. But Got it. Seeing no additional questions or comments, I would call, call a vote. Uh, Mr. Nixon? I'll vote aye. Ms. Bolognese? Aye. Ms. Bergstrom? Aye. Ms. Marchant? Before I vote, I'm going to say I'm very disappointed that we took out the third paragraph that specifically talks about our most vulnerable students. But with that disappointment, I will still say I because the MCAS is a bad test. So there you go. I'm very disappointed, though. Chair votes I. The motion is unanimous. Thank you, everyone. I think this is an important discussion that we have. I think it's an important discussion we continue to have. Um, and I don't consider this in any way wasted time. This was one of the most important things we did tonight, I believe. Moving on, we have a vote to accept um, uh, Winchester High School PFA grants. Um, Dr. Evans, would you like to um, uh, kick this off? Sure. So the um, Winchester High School PFA is a very generous support of parents. Um, they are donating uh, sound machines and interactive therapy counseling tools to the counseling department, the adjustment counselors, and resources for world language, including e-readers and a digital learning platform and an electronic subscription for authentic reading resources. Um, the total is $3,280, and I would recommend that you accept this uh, as presented. Any discussion or a motion? I move to accept the Winchester High School PFA grants in the amount of 3280 as presented. Second. Discussion? A roll call vote on this is required. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. Nixon? Aye. Ms. Bolognese? Aye. Ms. Bergstrom? Aye. Ms. Marchant? Aye. Chair votes aye. I'd like to uh, thank the Winchester High School PFA for this very generous donation to our high school. And uh, it's, it's well appreciated in a year of financial uncertainty. With that, we move on to the chair report. Um, there's two things I'd like to mention in our chair report. The first is that we will be holding office hours on November 4th at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, we have not finalized for sure who will be the uh, members in attendance at those office hours. We post the meeting as a meeting, so technically we can have more than two members. I think it's cleaner if we only have two members because then we don't need to take minutes and it is not a meeting in the end. However, uh, we can determine offline who should attend the, that meeting. Uh, at the last meeting, it was the chair and the vice chair, so we might s switch to somebody else. On the other hand, it's the day before town meeting, so there's some argument that the chair and the vice chair should be there the day before town meeting to answer <coughs> any questions that should there be any about um, anything taking place at town meeting. Again, we don't, have, we don't have a lot of things happening at town meeting. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And the second is I wanted to reiterate that on Monday the 26th at 5 p.m., the Board of Health is holding their regularly scheduled meeting and we've been invited to attend. Uh, again, uh, I, I'd actually like to ask the committee because it'll make my life easy. I'm gonna have to post this soon. If anybody in addition to the chair and the vice chair would like to attend that meeting, if you would let me know, if you, if you know you're gonna attend it now, at least one more person, then uh, I will post it. And if I, you don't know, then you can let me know tomorrow. So I, I know that I cannot attend. Okay. I would like to attend. Okay. So we will post it because we have at least three members who would like to attend. Uh, the agenda item will be a single agenda item, which will be um, update um, and communicate with the Board of Health and uh, the Director of Public Health. And we will uh, adjourn 
as soon as that is complete, it will not, um, we will not stay for their entire meeting. We will only stay for that one agenda item. And if you want to stay for the rest of the meeting, you're welcome to, but you would have to excuse yourself from uh, being a participant. So that's the end of my chair report, uh, superintendent report. I think I've covered it all tonight in the return <laughs> school. I think you have very well. Um, future agenda items, we have- Can I ask you a question just real quickly, Judy? Sure. How's everybody doing? We're holding on by the skin of our teeth. Um, I can't tell you how <coughs> hard everybody is working. And I know um, that it's not visible from the outside. We're the little ducks on the pond, and we are, our legs are about to fall off because we are paddling as fast as we can. <laughs> so the kids are great. The teachers are exhausted. This, this, the administration is, we've hit the wall. So if people would just give us a little grace and kindness for the next few weeks, that would be really appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Sure. Um, future agenda items. We discussed at our workshop the 20. 2020-21 district goals and improvement plan. We have that listed as a vote to approve. Uh, there will be edits made to that, and if we can't vote to approve it at the next meeting, it will be at the following one, but hopefully we can do it in the next meeting. Personnel update, an update on Lynch school building projects, and as always, an update on return to school. Uh, the fiscal 21 budget update, um, and essentially realignment, we're gonna need to look at a lot. That's not it, update doesn't do justice to what that is. Um, mascot logo update. And I would like to make a request, which I didn't put here. I think we are slightly behind in minutes. I think mm -hmm. uh, Yes, I, I meant to ask Frida about that. I don't, um, I know she's been working on them. Yes. We, pro we just have not had them on the uh, agenda. So we'll probably have a large minutes. Uh, I think that would be good. <laughs> and if we, um, if it's so significant, that we feel like it impairs in a particular meeting, we could have uh, uh, send them all out and get all of our edits and put them in a consent agenda so that it does not um, take up idea. our entire meeting. Um, uh, next meeting dates, as mentioned, we, I will be posting a meeting. I'm gonna piggyback on the Zoom uh, that the Board of Health will use because it will be their meeting that we're attending, but I'll still post it and that'll be on Monday the 26th of this month at 5 p.m. Uh, November 10th at 9.30 a.m. That was originally listed as a budget workshop. I think it will be a regularly scheduled meeting that will likely perhaps have budget discussion. November 17th at 6 p.m. and December 1st at 9.30 a.m. I would welcome a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. A second. A roll call vote is ne necessary. Mr. Nixon? Aye. Ms. Bolognese? Aye. Ms. Bergstrom? Aye. Ms. Marchant? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, everyone, for uh, getting us out of here under four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wincam. Thank you. Thank you.